Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is May 2nd, 2024. I'm here for uh, uh, an oral history I've been looking forward to a lot. Um, Frank, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, I'm Frankie Lasko, and uh, those who know me know I played for Go to Mentis and Driven by Hatred. Those are my main two bands that you know, the main standout bands that I played in. I was in several other bands over the years, but those are the two I'd like to highlight the most. And what, what instrument did you play for those who don't know? Oh, drums. I played drums for those bands, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, well, thank you, uh, Frankie, for being here and uh, recording your oral history. And before we get into music or anything else, let's just take it back. And um, why don't you share whatever you know about your family history and background. And if you know how your family ended up in the Bronx, let's hear about that, too. Oh, well, OK. Well, start off how we ended up in the Bronx. Uh, well, my grandparents, my father's father and also my mother's side were both born, you know, in, in New York City. Um, I believe in the Bronx. Yeah, I think both ends of the family were born in the Bronx. And that was back in 1918. Oh, okay. Wow. So, you know, I'm a third generation. I'm Italian. Uh, my my great-grandparents did come from Italy during that time when the ships came in or Liberty Island or wherever it was. And uh, they came with working papers. And, you know, I think Mussolini was running things at the time. So can't blame them from running, you know, from getting out of there. And uh, sure. so, yeah, since since my grandparents were born, here i mean not here in the bronx they were uh yeah we've been here my family as far as my parents go they were both born in the bronx as well and uh yeah i mean we, our lineage goes pretty much from the beginning i believe in new york city the bronx in particular do you know um like different neighborhoods that your family might have lived in over the years in the bronx your parents or grandparents oh. share that with you uh it's weird i know my mom lived with her uh, obviously her parents my grandparents uh i don't know where in the bronx to be honest with you i don't remember the area my older brother would know that because his memory is like uh i don't know i think he's an alien sometimes you know <laughs> but but uh he he would remember that location wise because he was you know he's uh seven years older than me so he would have a better memory of that period because he didn't live where we lived later on you know at that time so um I can only go by where I was born and where I, you know, grew up. Yeah. Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Well, I grew up on East Tremont and Carter Avenue, which is right off of Webster Avenue. Sure. And if you go right down the, uh, you go right straight ahead this way, there's Frank's Sporting Goods and that whole area there. Uh-huh. And uh, that was the area. The building was 333. It was uh, Tremont Towers. And that was, uh, at the time, a a, a big building, a prestige building when well, my grandparents moved there. And I believe in 65. Yeah. And once the seventies came, it all went downhill. But at that time, <laughs> at that time, it was, uh, our upper middle-class upper had doctor's offices in the lobby and, uh, and the whole uh -huh. thing. And, and you know how that goes, things change, things shift and, uh, things go bad and you move on to the next place. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so my grandparents moved there around my father's side, meaning not my mother's side. My mother's side lived, I believe, most of them lived in Brooklyn later on. I see. And I also moved my brothers with our mother to Brooklyn for a good six years around that time. Okay. Uh, around 1987, I think that was the year. Yeah. You know, prior to that, we lived in the same building in the Bronx, grew up there. Uh, and, and eventually, six years later, came back to that same building uh -huh. and, and continued from there. So, you know. Do yeah. you how do you do you have a good sense for about how old you were when you moved to Brooklyn for those six years? Well, 87, I might have been. Well, in 8 and 9, I was 11, maybe 9. OK, I see. I see. So so I guess uh, you went to elementary, I guess, a large part of elementary school in the Bronx then or. Um, do you oh yeah, I mean, which school you went to? Well, elementary school it was CES one sixty three. Okay, and that's now one. I think that's PS one sixty three now, but it was CES yeah. one sixty three at the time, and 
Yeah, that that was the first school I went to, and what I was, was late. Like? I ah, went to I see. Yeah, which means I didn't go to kindergarten. I went to first grade, and of course I failed, and I had to do first grade again. You know, <laughs> it was sure. A B C A B what? <laughs> but uh, you know, um, but yeah, from there, yeah, and then moved on to, I think from there we we went to. Uh, well, no, I'm thinking preschool. I'm a little confused on that. CES 163 was, yeah, the first grade up until. I'm trying to see, this is where I get a little confused. I'm just trying to figure out the years. Yeah, sure. Well, elementary, that would be, you know, that period. But then we finished elementary school. Okay, we finished in Brooklyn. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And uh, so that was. Uh, PS226, I believe, was the school around Brooklyn. We lived in uh, Avenue N on Day Hill Road, which is uh, basically the F train. Avenue N was the stop. It was a good hour, maybe an hour and a half trip from the Bronx. Wow. And uh, at that period, my parents, well, they've been separated. They were still very close, very good friends, just divorced, you know. Yeah, sure. So my father was living in the Bronx uh, uh, with my grandfather and my uncle as well. And uh, pretty much where we grew up most of the time. And when we lived in Brooklyn, my mother moved us out there for a while. And, uh, you know, had some great times there, too, because that was a different yeah, sure. type of, you know, versus what we grew up in versus there it was two two different planets, really. You know, uh, you know, you got Russian Jewish people. You had a big mix of people, which you really don't get where I'm, fr you know, where I'm from. Yeah, sure. So it was a different type of cultural thing. And uh, so we had a taste of that, a better life, so to speak. I see. In terms of environment for a good six years. So that kind of helped shape us, I think. That that little experience there kind of molds you into, you know, opens your horizons a bit. Yeah. You know? So in, in your old Bronx neighborhood that you you lived in until nine and then moved back to after Brooklyn, um, you know, what were some of the like families or friends that, that you were close with um, when you were there, aside from your own family? What do you mean in Brooklyn or in the Bronx? No, in the Bronx. Like, you know, did you have did you have a lot of close friends in the neighborhood? Like, um, you know, talk a little bit about your friends or, you know, maybe families that your well, family was with. Well, it's in the Bronx, I mean, again, we lived in that building. Uh, as far as me personally, and I was young later yeah. on, of course, but uh, the friends I met later, you know, these guys, the musicians, yeah, sure. right? You know, you start coming into your own and you start to, uh, you know, you get that age, 13, 14. You're like, OK, you try to find yourself at that age. And uh, of course, metal was the, you know, that was the avenue. Right. Absolutely. And uh, but there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, layers to that as far as how you get how I got into it and stuff. But uh, friends, I mean, I don't really have friends at that age before we went to Brooklyn. I was very young. Sure. You know, we knew a couple of people we hung out with, but uh for the most part, I was always a hermit. You know, I was the type of guy, I was the type of kid who was content with his radio, listening to the Beatles. Uh huh. And I was a big fan of the Beatles, still am. And those are the guys that turned me on to playing, which we should get into, I guess, later on. But uh, yeah, well. so music was always around the house. As far as my father, my uncle always played the classics, the old rock and the old rock stuff, and uh, the Zeppelin, Floyd, and. And everything in between. So the Beatles, of course, were huge. So, uh, you know, once I seen Ringo on, on TV, I was like, I like, I want to be Ringo. <laughs> I don't know what it was about Ringo, but Ringo uh -huh. just had that swing to him. You know, like, I, I, I love Ringo. I love that. So, and, you know, there's no denying the influence that band had in the world. And uh, That's right. I, I always had an ear for bands that were distinct and unique and, and, and different. You know, it was never a generic I didn't have, I never had generic taste. You know, it was always something that was special, different, you know. Uh, my ear was tuned to that type of stuff. I see. Did did anyone in your family um, play any instruments? Well, my father and my uncle, yeah, the, the Lasco side. My mother's side was the Spinelli side. Okay. Very talented, very talented as well. But I think I got my musical ability from my father's side. Uh, he was a guitar player. Uh, in their 63 maybe wow. 67 maybe around that period he was in a band called the majestics oh um, okay, okay and he was a lead guitarist and he wrote most of the music himself wow and, and sang and you know I, I 
the only person who had any memory of those songs was my uncle and he knew how to play them. And I would hear him play it. And I would say, those are really good songs. Yeah. And I always meant to sort of, I want these songs. I'm going to try to record them. Yeah. For dad, for dad and put his name on it. And, and it never happened because I lost my father a couple few years back. And, and my uncle passed funny enough. Uh, he passed away on my way here to Minnesota, which was about almost a year ago. Wow, man. And he was the last of basically that generation. He was the last one. My father passed. My mother passed years ago. She was 54 at the time. And uh, and her two sisters. And then my father had my uncle. He passed. So grandparents are gone. So everybody, that whole generation are gone now. You know, wow. So, and I guess the Majestics never made any recordings or anything like that. I don't think they did. Man. I don't think they did. You know, you know what happened? He was yeah. doing great, but then he met my mom, and you know how it is, chicks. Uh -huh. You meet chicks, and there it goes, right? <laughs> so you know, so you know, you're having a baby, and and there, that's the what that's what happens. But <laughs> wow, so, wow. Um, um, so yeah, you like you said, you were you were around music from the very get go, huh? Um, I was all I was always raised on it, yeah, and I was always raised around the good stuff too. And yeah. you know, again, living in the Bronx, you were you were raised around. A lot of the stuff that was going on in the streets at the time, whether it was rap or if it was, uh, uh, what is it like, uh, uh, Noel and all these guys that did that yeah. dance dance stuff there. Oh, you know, like the freestyle stuff. The right? freestyle was big, and you know what? It's weird at the time. You're like, oh, this sucks. But yeah. now looking back on it, I appreciated it because it, it, it's you know, music is a time machine. You can That's hear right. one song, and it basically just transports you to a specific time. Yeah. So they say, is time travel possible? I said, yeah, just listen to music. You know, Absolutely. music really, it's amazing how it could bring you back to high school in a half a second. Yeah, absolutely. You, get, you know, and you get those feelings inside of you like, oh, I feel great. You know, it, it brings you back. And so music to me has always been my escape. If I want to go somewhere mentally, I think music was always the the avenue to do that. Yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah. So, so after, um, after your time in Brooklyn, yeah, I guess you went to um, junior high in Brooklyn. I actually, before before we moved past Brooklyn, let's talk about well, that. Well, yeah, junior high, we, that's when we came back to the Bronx. I was oh, okay. ready to go to a school called Sethlo, Sethlo High School, which was music-based. Because uh, even back then, I always played drums. Even in Brooklyn, I was, you know, I was learning my rudiments and stuff through, yeah. uh, you know, marching you know, they would teach you that drum class, music classes back then, which I don't even know if they have anymore today or if they do. It's very scarce, you know. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, which is ridiculous because that's so healthy for you mentally to create. It's creative. It's good for you. It's uh, it keeps you out of trouble. I know. You know, um, maybe that's why they got rid of it. They want everyone in chaos. They love that, you know. Yeah, I know. I know. But, uh, they music and art and all that stuff. And yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, so I was about to go to Sethlo. I got accepted. And then we had to move back to the Bronx. So then I went to uh, PS 147. That was the junior high school. Okay. where Where's that at? Oh. I, remember. I can't remember. It wasn't far from where I lived. On okay. Colorado. Okay. Yeah. Just the neighbor, the neighborhood school, I guess. Right? Yeah. I mean, I could walk a few blocks and, and you know, took a little walk, maybe a good six minutes, seven minutes, and I'll be, I'll, I would be there. So, but the yeah. school was uh, 147, which is where I met Gigi. I know she mentioned that in an interview. Uh-huh. That's right. And her sister, I knew a sister as well there. And that's where we met. Um, we knew of each other at the time. And yeah. Uh, so yeah, 147. And after doing that and, you know, in, in, in junior high school, I played drums for the school and I was the drummer in the school and, in the yearbook, there's a, a photo this big of me in the center with with, with a floor tom, you know. Wow. <laughs> but I didn't get to play graduation, and it was my fault. Oh, yeah? What happened? My, well, what, well, being that I knew all the songs already, I felt I didn't need to show up to practice, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. so, so to spite me, when graduation came, I, I wasn't allowed to play. And then they had some other drummer who was horrible, and he was all off rhythm and stuff. And so they ruined the graduation, essentially, you know. But at the time, you know, you think you're too big for your bridges, you know, and you, <laughs> you're young, you know, your ego's up there, right? And so, uh, 
but they taught me a lesson. They deflated the balloon quick when they <laughs> can't play. <laughs> so, so at that point in your life, were you already kind of getting into heavier kinds of music? Well, the heavy music came from my brother, Bobby, my oldest brother. He was, uh, well, even in the Bronx, when he went to Roosevelt High School, uh, that's when he started to get into metal. You know, Maiden was the first band. Of course. And just yeah. like I think every Maiden fan in the world that started, they seen Eddie on an album cover and they said, uh -huh. I have to see what the hell this is, right? That's right. <laughs> and that's what Bobby did. He got Live After Death, which is a live album from this album, The Power uh -huh. Show. Exactly. Uh -huh. And which is a classic live album. And um classic. Bobby was uh hooked. That was it. Maiden was his band. It still is his band. So tonight he's, he's gonna be 54. Still his band. Wow. And uh at that point I was more into again the Beatles and the classics. I'm uh, very eclectic musically. Yeah, sure. You know, especially these days. But um I have a soft spot for all the classic rock bands and all the you know, you gotta understand where the foundation is. Absolutely. And any metalhead or any metal guy who disrespects bands before them, that's that sort of laid the foundation for it. The, to me, they're not really fans of music. They just yeah. they're looking for a click to fit into, but they really don't have a passion. You know, that's right. You got to have a respect for where things come from. Yep. And you could go to Jim Morrison. You could go to, again, the Beatles, Lennon, pushing it with Revolution and uh -huh. Health the Skelter. And, you know, Health the Skelter was probably the heaviest song at the time. It was. This is 67. Look at the riff. That's right. It's heavy, it's heavy stuff, you know. It is, it is. And, and uh, McCartney's doing the scream and the whole, you know. Uh -huh. No one did that. No one did it. So you have to understand where things start. That's right. People say Sabbath. Okay, Sabbath maybe was the first metal band in terms of that vibe, the yeah, dark yeah. vibe and stuff. But the ones to first sort of lay it down were people like, again, the Beatles. I think the uh -huh. Beatles were the first to do it, Helter Skelter, I think. Not intentionally. Sure, sure. But they weren't afraid to just think outside of the box and just every album would change. They yep. progressed. In seven years or eight years they were together, they they just totally changed. If you hear the first album to the last, just like, what? how did that happen? I know. Yeah. Completely different sounding band. Completely different band. Oh. And they weren't afraid. And then that's that's the the secret, you know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that's why they were who they were. And you know. So yeah, the Beatles, Stones, The Doors, I mean again, Zeppelin, uh, I could go back Skinnerd and I could go back and on and on with those bands who I just loved. And I would hear 101.1 CBS yeah. FM that would have the specials or rock classics and I would record them on tape. Uh huh. And uh, yeah, I mean, growing up on that stuff, we had a lot of vinyl, even with Billy Joel and all this type of stuff, but laying around the house. And so I grew up on that stuff. And then the thing that caught my ear later was when we moved to Brooklyn. I think, how old was I? Maybe eight, nine, maybe nine. Yeah. You know, my brother always, he had his own bedroom, blasting Maiden, usually Maiden. Other bands too, but Maiden was the... And uh, Flight of Icarus from Live uh, After Death, the, the live version. For some reason, that particular day, it caught my attention. It just yeah. happened. So I knocked on the door. I said, Bobby, what is that? Oh, that's Iron Maiden. This is... You know, fly to big here. He's like, hold it. It was cassette tape, double cassette at the time. He's like, take it over there with your radio and listen to it. And I think from that point on, I really started grasping the metal stuff at nine years old. Wow. And uh, yeah, that that's pretty much where it started. Bobby was the one to really get me into it, starting it off. And, you know, and from that point on, it was uh, just grew and grew. By the time I moved back to the Bronx, um, you know, I had a taste for it, and he would introduce me to other bands like Metallica. One yeah. day, he's like, "Sit on the bed. Here's the lyrics to Master of Puppets. I'm going to put it on, and you just read the lyrics along with the music, right?" And again, that's life changing because Master of Puppets lyrically is a great record too. Is, you know, um, some deep subject matter there, which was, you know, it'll make you grow fast. You know, metal, uh, it, it makes you grow up fast because it's, yeah. it's intelligent music. We're not talking warriors and wizard stuff. I'm talking the real stuff. That's right. That's and I right. like the warriors and wizard stuff too, but you know. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the real life stuff comes from those types of bands, you know, and uh, you know, and that's pretty much where it progressed. I yeah. see. I see. So um, by the time that uh, you were back in the Bronx, had you, obviously you were playing with the school band at all, but had you tried you know, playing 
with um you know any kind of guitarist or bassist on the side anything like that well the first time i attempted to start a band i believe it was in junior high school yeah i met i think again gg i watched the interview recently she mentioned eddie this kid eddie yeah yeah who was he was a skateboarder in the school but he also he, he played guitar okay you know he knew it a couple of ribs and he knew i was just playing around he's like hey could i come over we could try to jam something and we tried i think maybe two times and that was it you know that <laughs> it didn't go anywhere <laughs> you know when music came serious was when i met barry and that came uh when I was around 13, I was turning 14, maybe in a few months before that, but I was 13. And uh, that's when I joined a band. You know, that's when uh, we started. To, so that was the first time. Yeah, I see. And that 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 I guess was in high school. Is that right? Is that did you meet Barry in high school? Well, actually, it was junior high school going into okay. I was still in junior high, going into high school. Um, I met this kid, Anthony, also named they call him Kuko. OK, yeah. And he knew I knew him from the school and he knew Barry because Barry would hang up like two blocks up uh, from where I lived on East Tremont. And uh, there was a building there where a lot of the metal guys hung out. Rui was one of them. Rui, Rui again, is, is a, uh, you know, he was into the music, too. He's more of a punk guy. Yeah. You know, he loves metal and loves all that stuff. But he's more of the punk stuff, the horror punk, the misfits and, and all this type of stuff. And um so at the time, that's where he lived as well. So the metal guys lived up there. And um, Barry was asking around, anybody know a drummer? Kuko happened to live there too, up the block there. So, wow. oh, I know this kid Frankie from 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 school. And from there, pretty much, uh, yeah, one day Barry knocks on my door. I guess Kuko knew where I lived. So yeah. he knocked on my door and I see, you know, big Barry. I'm like, who, who the hell is this guy, right? <laughs> Hey man, you know I know Kuko, and I heard you. You know, heard you play drums, and so pretty much he's he. You know, from there we set up a little rehearsal together, and I got to meet him. And again, I'm only thirteen, right? I'm I'm going on fourteen, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I mean from there we we jammed. It was it was him, me. Uh, I think a bit later came Rendon, Jose, yeah. Rendon, and. Uh, Louie, I know, was around at the time, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he was yeah. part of that little metal metal clique back then, and he hung out, and he even jammed on the vocals a little, too, you know, on and off. But, um, yeah, a bit later, we had uh, 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 Rendon, and then it was us three, Barry, Rendon, and me. Barry played bass with distortion pedal, mind you, so it was, like, really good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it was bass and distortion. It kind of filled in that other guitarist, in a way. Yeah, sure, sure. You know? It kind of balanced it out a bit. And we wrote some of our early stuff then, you know, simplistic, straightforward. Sure. Funny names, you know, titles sure. like you know, evil this and evil that. And, you know, <laughs> you, know, right. you know, because I guess you had to do that stuff to look cool, right? Evil. Yeah. evil evil's cool, right? You know, <laughs> so, you know. That's right. So, um, uh, so before we get, you know, more into um go to mintus and and all of that well i guess at this point it didn't it didn't have a, a name yet probably even but before we get into um into that history uh uh why don't you talk some more about um uh you know i guess uh different kinds of metal um that you were you know being exposed to and listening to and uh and if you would like, you know, go to record stores or, you know, the, the way that you would obtain the music too. On my own. Yeah. Well, again, um, and I'm sorry, I did cut off before. I know there was a lot of stuff with the family history. I could, you know, I could go on how I was raised and, and as far as with the family, if you want to, I know I'm hopping around. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. I think I have... I we'll think I have undiagnosed out. ADHD or something, probably. You know. <laughs> no, so, that's fine. Uh, some some people some some people's oral histories, you know, hop around a lot because memories work in all different kinds of ways. So, I uh, guess, yeah, yeah. So, so, but uh, but yeah, we'll you know we'll 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 carry on with Godamentis in a little bit, but we'll take it back to a few other things first. Um, but but let's stick with the music for a second and just uh, sure. uh, okay. you know, yeah. All right. So, yeah, I mean, again, I was raised with my brother who was a big collector. I mean, he would go to Bleaker Bob's all the time and pick up these 
um, bands. You know, you'll have your regular bands, your Dio, your Megadeth, Metallica. Bobby, Bobby was a big collector and a big fan and a uh, huge collection too, CD, cassette, and everything else. Wow. And his collection always grew. And um, I mean, again, I learned most of my stuff from him. I would just take a CD off his rack and listen to it. And, and I would just sort of look into it myself. He would like to look for the obscure bands, bands you didn't know, of Sweden, from Germany, uh -huh. that war, you know, relapse records. A lot of them were on Black Mark records. Black Mark records had some of the best death metal bands out there. Yeah. I mean, um, and they came from, I believe, that was Swedish, German, Sweden, you know, around that, around those areas there. Sure. And uh, there was a band called Rosicrucian, which was, uh, I'm a huge fan of that band. That was one of the heaviest bands I got into at the time, an album called Silence. Huh. And you listen to that record yourself. Musically, it was really uh, 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 excellent musicianship. Great. So it's called Rosicrucian Silence. That's it has like this this ear on the on the cover, grayish sort of background. Wow. Um, fantastic album. Musically, if you listen to it, you can say, wow. Yeah. So that really opened my horizons on the musical front. Like, wow, you could do a lot of stuff in this. And uh you know, that that period, and again, when I lived in the Bronx, when I met Barry, Barry had his own stuff, Cannibal Corpse and Deicide and Yes. And again, so did my brother. So it was both of those guys. Barry I see. introduced to a lot of things. Because again, he was he's a few years older than me. So sure. And you know, I consider Barry a brother more than just the best friend. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> he's my 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 third brother, you know. I got three brothers. I mean, excuse me, my fourth brother. <laughs> It's me, and I have three brothers. He's he's my fourth brother. So, yeah, he introduced me to a lot of things. And um, along with his influence and my brother Bobby, um, I had an understanding of the music. So when we did start Go to Mentis, I had an understanding of how it should sound. And, and so I didn't have the skill set to play it yet. Though. Uh -huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, because I wasn't a double bass drummer or anything like that. Bass I was going to ask yeah, I was single player. I played, you know, I played around. I wasn't playing that music, though. Yeah, sure. So that was a big, you know, you start playing maybe some Maiden stuff a little bit, the Beatles, and then you're going to, you know, death metal. That's a big jump. <laughs> With blast beats and... <laughs> well, yeah, and you're like, okay. So. <laughs> but, you know, you learn. You you figure it out. It takes a lot of practice like anything. And, and Yeah. You know, you listen to albums and you try to emulate what you hear. And that's kind of what I did. I tried and I kept working on it. Big help to Alan, who's the friend of, uh, I'm excuse me, he's my friend and also brother of Milton who passed away. Uh -huh. We used to rehearse at Milton's house as well. And, uh, so, you know, I, he used to let me use his drum kit. I see. Did you have your own drum kit at your apartment? At that time, I did have a drum kit. Yeah. I had a, uh, yeah, I think it was a four piece kit with one cymbal or two cymbals. And, um, yeah, I had that that kit, single bass pedal. Yeah. Do you remember and, uh, where you got that kit or how you got that kit? Okay, this yeah, I got need to focus. You see, maybe I need a pill for that. Maybe I could start focusing more. <laughs> you know? My brain has been in so many places over the years. It's like, okay, so the um, first kit I got was on Christmas of uh, nineteen eighty nine. Okay. And it was a gift from my father and my mother. They they both. Because prior to that, I would take my grandfather's pots and pans and bing, 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 and bang uh -huh. on them, you know. I, it was always in me to play drums. It, it just, that was the instrument I, I, I you know, that was the one. So um, my mother, I guess, told my father, we said, I think Frankie has something here. I think you should try it. We should get him a kit. There's something here. I don't know what it is, but let's give it a shot, right? And sure enough, on Christmas Day, uh, of 1989 my father's like hey frankie go to my room and get my cigarettes I said, okay I went to his room and there was the drum set uh-huh and he was that was my gift and that was of course i screamed like i think i turned female for a second you know <laughs> and um yeah i was really excited about that it wow. was a big deal that was a life changer really absolutely and it was a percussion plus kit which were basic starter kit full-size real drum set but 
lower end, you know, he bought that at Bronin's, Bronin's Music, which was in the Bronx. I was going to ask you if he got it at Bronin's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bronin's, is a, I love, I, I, if I was in the Bronx now, I'd probably be walking around there, you know, because I got a lot of my equipment from them. And, um, yeah, that's where that kit came from. And um, I started practicing on there. Automatically, I had coordination. And my mother's like, you see, I knew he had something. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I knew how to work my limbs separately. Sure. Whereas a lot of people have, they, they can't just, you know, distinguish, you know, uh, you know, they can't sort of separate each limb. Sure. They kind of stop and hit and stop. You know, they don't have the, the flow, the natural flow. So I had it and uh, that was pretty much it. You know, I, from there, I just practiced a lot. And my uncle used to always jam out because he lived with us too in the Bronx as my grandfather, my uncle, and my father lived in the same apartment. It was a big apartment. And um, my uncle played keyboards. Wow. He played guitar. Uh, great guitar player, too. And, hey, Frankie, get behind the drums. Jam with me, you know. So I would just, he would play his favorite music. His favorite band, I think, was Zeppelin. The Beatles, yeah. Zeppelin. Um, And he would say jam with me. And a lot of blues. He loved the blues. Uh -huh. And I love the blues. I'm a big blues fan, too. So he'll do some blues licks and I would just sort of jam with him with the blues. So, you know, I learned a lot from my parents, my uncle, and, uh, you know, I, I thank them for all the taste that I have because I grew up with the right music. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And I, and, you know, I, I, and I have a son who's was going to be three and I'm going to make sure he grows up with the right music too. <laughs> That's, <know>. right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, what, what'd your family think of, um, when you and your brother, you know, were getting more into metal, what was their impression of the music that you were listening to, if you remember? Well, my mother never really, my mother's very open. She was very open-minded, so she was cool with it. Yeah. She's like, you know, just make sure you make the right decisions in your life. But whatever you like, that's your business. If you enjoy it, enjoy it. That was my mom. My mom, you know, Bobby would play Maiden stuff, live videos and stuff, my oldest brother, and... uh she says, what a bass player that is, Steve Harris. Wow. My mother even noticed the bass coming through. That's she's cool. Like, wow. She's a hell of a bass player. My mom knew it right away. So Steve Harris is one of the greatest bass players. Uh -huh. And uh, he was a lead bassist, not just some guy in the background, right? That's right. And he made it cool to be up front. Um, one of the few that did that at the time. And, uh, you know, and she was a big fan of Bruce's voice also from Maiden. Wow. She's like, he has a very powerful voice. I love his voice. So my mom had a mind where she was open-minded enough to, to, to absorb, but she heard something great. It was great. Yeah. She wouldn't put it in a, a box and say, well, I don't look into this box. Yeah, sure. You know, she was like, it was cool. It was cool. Yeah. yeah. And the same with race and everything else. She didn't care about, she, she never, you know, discriminated against anyone. It didn't matter what you were. Yeah. You know, just make sure they're good people. That's it. Yeah. You know, and that's how my mom was. And my, my father's side, too. I mean, but uh, my dad, sometimes he would make fun. Like, he would drive my brother crazy. Yeah. You know, like, oh, what is this stuff? He would make fun at him. But made it in all these bands, you know. And then so Bob used to get upset about it. Because you're already a teen years. You you take that stuff to heart, you know. That's, yeah, that's, you my, stuff. that's my music, man, you know. <laughs> but funny enough, um, Bobby didn't have a chance to change my father's you know, perspective on that stuff, but I did. Yeah. So when I started, you know, really getting into it, I would watch video, say, dad, watch this video with me. Yeah. And he would lay there and watch the video. And, you know, in the, at the end of it, he would start saying, you know, these guys are pretty good. Huh. You know, I started to, cause he's a musician. He knows sure. how to play. So he understood the talent that goes behind it. That's right. And he understood. He started to understand. It's like, these guys, how do they remember all that stuff? You know, like, this is they're great, you know? And so, I woke him up to that stuff and he never had a bad thing to say about Maiden really anymore after that. I, I got him into it. <laughs> he understood, <laughs> you know, you know, so I was like, yeah. it's just heavier, faster versions of what you grew up with. Yeah. Right? That's right. or whatever it is. That's all it really is. You know. Now, now do you ever show your dad a, a cannibal corpse? Uh, <laughs> oh, my fault. Well, that stuff he didn't. So we, we're Italian. So we're raised Catholic, right? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You know, as I get older, I, I'm more Christian than a Catholic. To me, Catholicism is the twisted version of the, the Christianity. So, so you know, that's a whole different thing. I'm not a huge religious guy, but that's my, 
you know, you have to find something. That's that's what I kind of believe in. So, sure. Um, but yeah, when you see lyrics like you know, he would make fun. He used to call it blah blah music, you know. So that was the name of it. So. <laughs> blah 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 blah, you know. So that's what he that's what he heard, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Are you still playing that blah blah music, Frankie? You know. <laughs> so it was funny, you know, and his invitation of it was really funny. So he's like, get into you want to get into a band like more of the heavy metal stuff. That's fine, you know, with a singer, a guy who could sing, and you know, <laughs> what's the blah blah? He's like, uh, you know, how do you find your vocalist? Throwing up in a bathroom somewhere? I mean, you know, stuff like so. <laughs> so he was funny as hell. I mean, you know, yeah, but yeah. he was never strict about it. He just had his opinions on it, you know. Sure. So, um, but yeah, he he didn't approve of the anti God stuff, which is. Sure understandable i said dad it's just sort of a an image i don't think any of it i mean barry wrote most of the lyrics if yeah. that's what he believes that's i didn't write the lyrics you know i played the drums to it so you know um if that's what he believes or if it's just for what he was feeling at the time that's fine yeah yeah so um but yeah i mean he didn't approve of that part of it and he's like frankie if you want to make it in this music business i mean you got to stray away from that and maybe try to do something else, you know <laughs> And he wasn't wrong. I mean, he wasn't yeah, wrong. Right. You know? When he grew that's up, you realize, yeah, dad, dad was right. <laughs> but you know, I tell him, dad, I like it. I feel it. That's what I'm feeling right now. So yeah, you know. So he understood. He was never strict. I had a great father, a great mom. In terms of good people, you know. Yeah. So uh, I miss him a lot because they were great people. And it, it it seems like um, you know your extended family was around all the time. Also, I mean, you know, uncle who lived with you. your grandparents were in the same building my grand uh, yeah well yeah we lived with our grandparents for many years growing up that's where we lived with my father basically and my yeah, uncle yeah. yeah and again like my mom took us out for six years in brooklyn and she gave us the taste of a different life and i'll always thank her for that but sometimes you can't maintain that that's and right. so my father always at that point when we came back my father made sure he rented another apartment in that building and uh we had a place to go and uh that's pretty much from that point on. And I'm grateful for that experience in Brooklyn. But I'm also grateful that we came back to the Bronx because that's where my life really changed in terms of meeting the people I met. I would have never met Barry or any of these guys. These guys are really important to me in that's my great. life. So, uh, you know, that would have never happened. It would have been a different thing altogether. Who knows what would have happened, you know? My, yeah. In Brooklyn with the Italians, man, owned a pizza store or something, you know. <laughs> but, uh, who knows, right? Um, Frankie's pizza, right? Yeah, right. You know, now, before you met Barry, um, had you been to any concerts or shows, anything like that? Well, before I met Barry. You're pretty no, young, I, so probably not. not no, I haven't been to any shows. No, the first show I did go to was with Barry. It was Murphy's Law, the Luna Chicks. Uh, that was the first gig I've seen. Oh, okay. uh, where it was, I can't remember. So Barry can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe the Continental. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't remember the club. Okay. Um. So I was about fourteen, maybe third, fourteen around that time. You know, they give you the wristband. You can't drink and stuff like that. Yeah. Of course, I had a beer anyway. You know. Of course. <laughs> who's watching, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, that was my first live experience in terms of those underground bands that were kind of popular. Murphy yeah, Law sure. was pretty popular at the time, and. Sure. Uh, and the Luna Chicks, you know, a pretty good band, too. So that was my first taste of the stage, watching a live band on the stage. And do you remember um, what your impressions were from from that show? Because I imagine there's a lot of things that you uh, probably hadn't seen before that were going on. Well, <laughs> like, no, it was pretty things cool. like that. Was, well, people jumping around and having a great time, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't see anything out of order or anything. I just seen people having a great time. You know, I never experienced so. people... I don't remember if there was a mosh pit or anything. Maybe there was. Yeah. But um, I, I do remember enjoying it, seeing yeah, a sure. band playing live on stage, an actual, you know, the drummer and the guitar, everybody's up there. And it's like, I, I definitely want to do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, that that really, that's what I want to do. I, I always did. And um, so, yeah, that experience was great. Yeah. And then, and then later on, we went to other shows together and stuff and, you know, whatever was going on at the time, if I could go, I was in school, I was doing the music thing, and sometimes I didn't have time, but when I had time, we used to go and, you know, more and more CBGBs or 
wherever a good show was going on and I could get in yeah, uh, and, 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 and absorb it all because the live experience is different. It is. Yeah. Um, what about any like big arena shows that you might've gone to at this time? Like, did you see Iron Maiden or, you know, any of the bigger bands like in big concert venues? Well, later on I seen, well, I seen Maiden the first time on my own really. Okay. Uh, Cause I was working since I was 16 yeah. It was on and off, mostly working. So when you start getting your own money, and yet your parents are still paying your rent, uh -huh. you know what do you do? Is you go to work, and then you go to Tower Records when you're finished, when you get paid. And then I, that's where I started. Tower Records was the place where I started to collect in Central Avenue and Yonkers. Uh -huh. My brother Bobby at the time was a manager for Petland Discounts, and he got me a job there. And um, yeah, every paycheck I would go. It was a couple of blocks that way in Central Avenue, right? To Tower Records and go through everything and pick things up and, you know, get my own collection going. And uh, my first show, well, I seen Bruce Dickinson on his first, uh, 1997. That's when he left Iron Maiden. Yeah. And he had Adrian Smith with him doing a solo thing. And I seen them at Coney Island High, which was an underground club. Yeah, sure, sure. And to see a man of that stature, you know, doing arenas, playing a small venue like that, it was an experience because you really could see how great he is when you hear it in that close. You know, the man was bigger than the whole place, right? Absolutely. Hanging on the uh, the lighting rigs and, and doing <laughs> his thing. and But his voice was, you know, amazing. And to hear that so close up front. Wow. And my first bigger show was when I seen Maiden in 98. A lot of Maiden shows in the mix because that was my favorite band. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And it still is. still yeah. is. They're the top heavy metal band to me. There is no band better, in my opinion. Um, because they're, uh, they have integrity. They do what they do. And they made it this far with no radio and barely uh -huh. any TV. And, uh -huh. you know, I respect that. That's grassroots stuff. It is, it is. And they do things on their own terms and... That's the way you do things, and they keep it real, and that's that's why I love that band. Yeah, and they're in their mid sixties, seventy year old. The drummer's seventy. I know, and they still have the same mentality. They haven't changed at all. I know it's incredible. You know? They always say, "Without our fans, we're nobody." So we always appreciate them, and we try to always give them the best we can. And I respect that. Yeah, you know, I respect. That's not about all the money. Yeah, it's a business now. Sure, but uh, sure, it's a business. But they still have a lot of integrity. And uh, as do a lot of other bands too that still go. So, yeah, sure. They're not Absolutely. looking for radio, radio friendly hits. They're just doing what they love, and uh, it so happens to work. You know. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, do you do you have other things you'd like to say about your family? You you um you know you've touched some on your your mom and dad at this point, but um other things you'd like to say about your family or you know the way you were raised your childhood before we um you know hit it hard with go to mintus okay well how was i raised i mean again i grew up i was young i grew up with my grand my grandfather my father at that point um my mom was going through her own battles you know as do as did a lot of people from that generation you know whether it's drugs and other things my father too at some point sure um and you know that was typical of the time when you grew Absolutely. up in the late 60s, 70s, and that was the thing back then, you didn't know the harm of the cause. But you know, my mom never had it easy. I mean, she, even as a little girl, that's a whole different thing, but she always had, uh, 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 she never really enjoyed her life. She never had a great childhood. So my mom always been through hell. So, and despite all of it, she was a great woman. And uh, so that's what counted at the end of the day. Um, so she'll have her relapses at times and stuff. So, you know, she'll be doing her thing, trying to get better. So it was on and off until, again, she moved us out to Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, she was straight. and Everything was great. Um, my dad at the time, I would say probably the 80s and stuff, he had his he had a gambling thing back then and his own addictions, which he stopped. I mean, he, he was the type that could stop it. And that was it. Sure. You know, some people can't. Or they can, but then it, it sometimes creeps up on you. My dad, so we're all built differently. I don't judge anyone, you know. <clears throat> you know, you have to live in someone's shoes to understand them. So you have no business judging anybody. That's right. So, um, yeah, I mean, the upbringing was great. Overall, it was great. I mean, um, 
my grandfather, you know, he was a great cook. So food was always good in the house. You know, the Italian food, Sunday dinners, and and uh, you can't go wrong with Sunday dinners. I mean, no way. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, when I was very young, my grandmother, who uh, grandmother Jenny, my fa my grandfather's wife. You know, I didn't know her many years. She passed away in 84, I believe. Diabetes, you know, she had it where it ate her alive, basically, you know, mm. at the time. And she wasn't disciplined. Yeah. So I want cake. That's it. That's what I want. So one of those people. So uh, it basically ate her alive. And so yeah. I lost her when I was very young. And um, so my grandfather, uh, basically him, again, my father, my uncle. I was raised by them. And my mom, too. I mean, she would come frequently and, and, and stay for a while and do, you know. So, you know, it was always, it wasn't together. Mom and dad weren't together, but they were still in our lives. Sure. And most importantly, they didn't have anything negative to say about each other to us, which is, yeah. which a lot of parents tend to do. Your father's a piece of trash. You know, you, you don't do that. You don't do that with your kids because they yeah. no, you, know, you just don't do that. So they didn't do that. So they were very close friendship wise. It just didn't work relationship wise. It happens, you know, um, but they understood what it took to keep it unified to some extent for the, for the kids. Right. Sure. So, um, yeah, we grew up with the music stuff. Um, the neighborhood was at the time, again, a lot of freestyle hip hop, the run DMCs, LL Cool J's, and uh -huh. all that stuff. My brother Andrew now, who's about a year and a half older than me, you know, he, all of them like metal rock to some extent. You know, Bobby's probably the biggest fan, and then me. You know, we, we, we I think we gravitated the most toward the metal stuff. Sure. You know, it took to us the most, but, you know, Andrew likes his stuff, you know, and uh, my youngest brother, Daryl, who lives in Minnesota here, um, also grew into it as well. So he's very eclectic. You know, he's more more so, you know, into the, well, now it's it changed, but like the R&B stuff and, and yeah, sure. basically whatever's really good, he'll like it. So yeah. he grew into it more now as he got older. Um, but the upbringing was okay. I mean, it was, uh, it was rough. I mean, it wasn't easy. You know, living where you live, you had your bad times, you had your good times. Uh, but um, overall, I have to say they try their best. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, it, it, it was okay. Again, I, I appreciate those experiences being out, you know, going through it. So. Sure. Um, I can't really pinpoint anything at that point, you know, unless I really get into little details, you know. Like um, in 1985, you know, I was Chuck Norris for Halloween and. <laughs> My brother Andrew was Lino from Thundercats, you know. So I mean, you know, I can I remember little things that sure. meant something, you know. Sure, sure, sure. That makes sense. My memory pinpoints the stuff that mattered, whether it was bad yeah. or good, that made a uh, an impact, you know. Otherwise, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um. So what what high school did you end up going to? I went to Walton. Oh, okay. You which is to... right next to Lehman Lehman College. Uh huh. Right next door. So, you know, and I would have a cut school. I would hang out in Weeman, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the chicks were older there. So I was like, chicks, college chicks. You know? <laughs> so, you, know, you know, you could just sit in the lounge there and nobody cared. You could just walk in. I'm sure you can't do that now, but back then yeah. you could. Yeah. That's and, funny. Yeah, wow. Walton was great. I think that was a great experience because, you know, high school is where, uh, again, the bands that I was in. You know, go to Mentis and not, go to Mentis was around 94. Yeah. So it was 93 going into 94, I think 94. And, um, you know, transitioning into high school at some point there. Um, it was great. I met some other friends there that, that I was really close with. And, uh, you know, at the time you meet certain friends, usually the high school friends are the ones that stick with you the most. Sure. You'll have one or two that you still remember, you know, fondly, you know. And uh, high school was great. I also played drums there. And uh, I got along with everyone. You know, I, I I made it through. I didn't do great in school because I felt it wasn't, I don't know, I guess I don't like the institutional feel. I don't like to be locked in a place. Sure. 
you know, maybe again, it's undiagnosed something that I have. Who knows, right? Yeah, but yeah. um, I I educated myself. You know, I got to twelfth grade. I made it to my senior year, and then I dropped out because that was smart. You know, <laughs> at the time, I'm thinking, well, I play drums. I'm gonna make it. You know, yeah, that attitude. Of course. Was, most of these rock stars, you know, they didn't finish finish elementary school. You know, that's right. <laughs> so I figured I could do this. I had a dream all the eggs into one basket type of thing. And, uh-huh. you know, but uh, that didn't work out, of, of course, which is fine. But, but yeah, I had a good time in high school. That was the time when you're growing. And again, you meet certain people, you come into your own. Musically, I was active. So in high school, no one was doing that. Yeah. I'll have, you know, I'll have, you know, Barry from, you know, would go to Mentis or Tito from DVH at some point, driving by and picking me up. You know, whether it was a Trans Am a car he had or a, I think a 66 Chevy Nova, I think he picked up. And Okay. <laughs> Tito always loved to fix cars. So he bought a, a 66 Nova and he got to paint it over again and fix some things on it. And uh, so, like, who's this kid getting into this fancy car? <laughs> yes, I'm in a band, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you little peasants just watching man, you know. And but, we're- uh, you know were there many other people at Walton that were, um, you know, in the same no. to the same kind of music that you were? Well, yeah, I met some people and in, 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 I had a little click there. Yeah. Uh, most notably, a friend called Sue, Sue Ellen, who was, a, you know, big time metal metal chick. She came into the school. She was about a year, probably a year after I got there or two years. Yeah. So she was starting while I was maybe my second year in or whatever it was. And, yeah, she was a big fan of the music. Um, thick rock chick. She she hits. She checks all the boxes, right? Yeah. And so that was different, you know. Yeah. And a few other people, you know. Uh, we had a few people on and off that we hung out with there. She's the one I remember most, and then we had a couple of others there that we hung out with, and uh, a little click. You always get a little click together. No one that I hung out with later. Yeah. You know. I mean, later on, I mean, Sue, Sue kind of stuck around for a while, but then she moved on did her own thing. She moved to, a, you know, Florida or whatever it was. So she went to Florida and did her own thing there. And, but, you know, I mean, now and then we would keep in touch. And um, most of the friends that I hung with came from outside of Walton. Sure. You know, through, again, the connection to Barry and then his friends. And then when you're the in a band. up the block, right? Those guys. And yeah. Yeah. And when you do a show or you start, the word gets around that you have a band, people want to come over and watch practices, right? Uh-huh. So then you start meeting people there. And when you start doing shows, that's when you start meeting everyone. Sure. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's where it really happened. Those are the people I hung out with most. Milton, the band guys, mostly. Yeah, sure. You know, sure. because you're with them, you know, you're really putting a lot of effort into it. So we, we would be, you know, we're like family. We would be together a lot. Yeah. So if it wasn't in the musical sense, it would just be hanging out, you know? Absolutely. So, you know. And, and do you remember um, when you first met Martin? When did Martin first come into the mix? Well, yeah, Martin came in. Well, if the band started around 94, Martin didn't come in that long after. I mean, yeah, I would say a few months down the line. Yeah. Uh, a few months down the line, I met Martin. And again, we rehearsed in my apartment at the time where I lived for a while. I would say maybe six months or so or some while. And then Milton had a place, his apartment with his parents. And again, his friend, I mean, excuse me, his brother, Alan, had his own drum kit. They shared a room together. <clears throat> so Milton was a guitarist. His brother, Alan, was a drummer. And we would have rehearsals there. Alan would let me use his kit. Not always approving of it you know it's not like he, it's not like he gave permission he would come home from from school and say uh, what's this little guy doing behind my drums you know <laughs> but it's so shiny and red you know so, <laughs> but no you know and, and of course down the line i bought that drum set from alan i did buy oh, that drum kit. wow so um that was a kit that we did use later on because he eventually stopped playing drums he focused on college and his career and stuff and uh he's uh you know, that's where Martin and all of us really got our chops together in that apartment. I see. And then, of course, music studios. That couldn't last forever. You have neighbors, sure. and, you know. 
you know, eventually the neighbors are going to think Satan has entered the building, you know, <laughs> El Diablo, you know, <laughs> That's so, right. you know <laughs> running out. So, yeah, we started renting little rooms here and there. Bronin's at, at Bronin's. some point during sure. that time that had, I think, a downstairs area or back area that was like a little rehearsal space. Yes. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, dingy little place, but you know what? It was a place to rehearse, so yeah. we did that. And uh, eventually, Music Unlimited uh, sure, was sure. a place that that's where we practiced the most. Uh, that was the place where uh, that was the most go to. We even rented a room there once. It was a monthly fee, and we had a room there, and that's where we really started <clears throat> getting it together. And uh, during that time, it's funny because that time, even before that. In the mix is when I joined Driven by Hatred. Ah, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah. You know, while I was with Go to Mentis, I joined DBH. I would say probably maybe a year and a half in Go to Mentis, okay. or maybe two years. Maybe like 96, 97. Maybe around 96, like 96, yeah. Uh, it's weird because the timeline is kind of blurry as far as how long yeah. DBH was together with me in the band. Yeah. We had some record. I mean, we recorded some compilations. Uh, we put some yeah. songs on there. And uh, our last demo we did was it's called Time's Up, uh, which was a an EP. And uh, it was really good stuff. I mean, funny thing is, no, no one really has it. It was on I cassette. Heard. Yeah. And it's really good stuff. I know Shane, the guitarist for DBH, I know he has all the, the files and stuff. Now, I had them on file, but I don't have them anymore. Yeah. So I think that showed how uh, how great we got over that period of time. Sure. Uh, musically. I mean, when Go to Mentis, we were writing. We were getting great at that. And uh, I think Barry's the one who says, I heard DBH looking for a drummer and stuff. And I got wind of it. And I was like, hmm. So, I mean, Barry didn't mind if you wanted to do something else. He wasn't one of those band guys, you know? Yeah, yeah. You belong to my band only, you know? <laughs> You know, Barry's like, look, do what you want to do. As long as you play here and everything's good. So that's what we did. And uh, I think I got Tito's phone number. I believe that's how it worked. I called Tito and uh, I says, you know, he knew who I was. He heard of me. I says, you know, Frankie, go to Memphis. He heard of me. He's like, yeah, what's up? Heard you need a drummer. I would like to try out. And um, again, during that period, I was juggling bands. So uh, DBH had, you know, I went to a rehearsal. I, I think the rehearsal was at this house. I think when I met them, we had that space already. It was already there. Yeah. It was a house. I think a friend of Tito's or something, uh, they own the house in the basement area. We used as a rehearsal space, which later became a space for Godomentis and DBH. Uh huh. <clears throat> so it was a good spot to go. And that's the area where we really got our stuff together. Because we would go through a set list. Let's go through it again. You know, four, six, six times, we'll keep running through the same set list over and over again. Wow. To uh, iron out any kinks that were in the, uh, anything. We would say, do it again. I didn't like the pace of that one. Let's do it again. And we keep going through it and going through it. And, you know, we really tightened it up in that rehearsal space there. Sure. And again, DBH lasted a couple of years. <clears throat> then the band broke up completely. Yeah. Um, and we tried, we wanted to do it again, but it just never really materialized because, uh, it just didn't, the timing, it just, it just didn't work out whether it was one couldn't do it or, you know, me, I was just trying to survive out there working a lot. Yeah. I mean, it just couldn't happen. Even later on in the years, even recently, maybe a few years back, they wanted to try something. I couldn't do it. Yeah, you know, just because I was living alone at the time and working two jobs and, you know, it just it, it just couldn't happen anymore. Yeah. Real life, real life kicks in and then you can't really enjoy things yep. as far as your hobbies go. You know, that's right. How these guys do it. I don't know how they keep juggling it. Yeah, I know. I they know. got it's kids, nice. they got wives, they got jobs, and somehow they're always at rehearsal. So I'm like, I know. Like, could you clone yourselves? Do you have like a machine somewhere? Are you clone it? Because how do you pull that off? Because I'm exhausted every day, you know? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. It's not um, like we play jazz. You could be asleep, you know? <laughs> We're playing music that's, you know, you need a lot of stamina for, you know? And right. I, so I don't know how they pull it off, but they do it. Uh, um, do you remember what what was the first show with Go to Mintis? I, I, I was it uh, 
uh, the first show that you played with Go to Memphis? First show was at Bond Street Cafe. Uh huh. Like the year was in 1994. Yeah, yeah. Later on in the year, I forgot, maybe June. Barry's really good with dates like that. Sure. Um, we played hey. our first show. Yeah. Uh, at the Bond Street Cafe, and I thought it was a great show. I mean, uh, it was our first gig. I remember. I'm not, I I don't remember how many songs we had, but we put on a good show. I mean, the fan, the audience was really happy with it. Uh, we felt really good about it. I wish somebody taped it. I think somebody did tape it. Somebody, and no one could find where that tape is. But uh, it's one of wow. those like the mysterious filmmaker, you know, <laughs> that was in the that was in the audience. You know, I don't know who it was, but uh, so we can't find that footage anywhere. And then the second show, I think, was the Blue Frog. Is that right? Blue Frog was the second show. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember With much about that show? Well, I know DBH played that show. They had a drummer before me, Don Murphy, who was a really solid player. You know, yeah, Don yeah. was more. He was more in the pocket. He was an in the pocket player. I see. I me, see. I'm more of a spontaneous sort of. I like to live off the cuff a little bit. Yeah. Play off the cuff. You know, if I'm feeling a fill at that time, I'm going to try it out. Doesn't always work. Sometimes it does. Right. Yeah, that's but, right. Uh, Don was really solid in the pocket. Me, I was more of a free, you know, free-spirited player. Different style. Uh, so anyway, they played. They were great. I always thought DBH was great. When I heard their demo, the first demo, I was like, these guys are different. So that's why when I heard they needed a guy, I says, I would love to play that because it's a lot different from Go to Mentis. It's a different uh -huh. thing. More hardcore stuff, you know? Yeah. Which is what I got into a little bit later, toward that time, around that time. Uh, I see. I was going to ask you. I see. I see. I see. I mean, Biohazard probably was my favorite. Still, see the tattoo? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm a big Biohazard guy. Sick of it all, of course. Mad Ball and all these guys. So me, Biohazard was a good hybrid. They were great. They were a great hardcore band, but they had heavy metal elements. They had guitar leads. Absolutely. Driven by Hatred had guitar leads. Shane was a great guitarist even back then. Yeah. So when I heard that demo, I was like, this guy's hitting all the right notes. I like the guitar playing a lot. And, uh, and the band was solid. So I said, oh, yeah, I, I could do that. I think yeah. I could I could do something there, you know. So, yeah, it was the Blue Frog. Go to Mentis played. DBH played. Uh, and a few other bands performed that night. And it was a really solid show. It was good. Sure. Yeah, it was a really good show. Do you remember... Um like some of the other shows that took place in this period, like around the Bronx specifically. I know you all were playing, you know, in Manhattan a lot, of course, too. And I, I you know. It, it, it's so strange because I was that type of person. <clears throat> we got a gig. Okay, let's go to the gig and play it. Yeah. You know, the only way I can remember sometimes is if you have a flyer or something. Sure, so, sure. Oh, yeah. You know, where we played and we played as many places as we can. Castle Heights. Uh, the train depot, uh -huh, those two the train places probably the most frequently visited places that we played. Sure, and that was Gordon Ventus or DBH or whatever. The, the, you know, Castle Heights and the, and the train depot were the main spots that we played. And we played other play. I think we played the Continental before. We played. I think we hit every club in that area some point or another. Sure, you know whether it was just opening up or mid mid the mid tier band or we headlined a few gigs too. Sure. Um, and a lot of times I play double because both bands are on the bill. Uh huh. Yes. You guys are trying to kill me, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um. Now, this is, th these are shows that I don't think Go to Mints has ever played at, but did you ever go to the Malali Park shows? Oh, yeah. I, we, we were supposed to play a show there. Uh. I think we were supposed to be on the bill for one of those shows, but somehow it never, it just didn't happen. I see, I see, I see. I'm a little cloudy on that. I'm not sure if our name was ever on the actual roster. Yeah, yeah. Or if it was, or if there was just no time. I really don't know. Barry, again, is better with that stuff than I am. Yeah. You know, I remember more of the studio time and the, and the demos and the creativity spots of it. Shows sure. to me were, were things you do in between. I enjoy playing them. Yeah. Most guys would tell you, I love playing shows. I hate the studio. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I'm the opposite. I love the studio uh, because you can really create. Yeah. You could hone in on what you're doing. It's private. You could get into your head a bit. Uh -huh. and shows are great too, when, especially when they go well. When they don't yeah. go well, you know, you want to jump out a window, right? <laughs> right so right. 
you know, but, um, you know, uh, I mean, I always enjoyed playing, especially when there were friends there and people that enjoyed it. So it was more for them than it was for me. I loved the sure. studio. I love making songs. I love making music. I loved uh, when guys would come to me and said, look, I have this riff. Let's come, come over. We're going to work it out. I enjoy that stuff. Sure. Because all the little neurons start lighting up and you're like, ooh, you know, it keeps you fresh. It keeps your mind going. That's right. That's right. So, well, um, well, obviously you were close with, with DBH since you played in DBH too, but do you remember some of the other Bronx bands um, that were, you know, influential for you during this period of time or that you were close with? Influential or that I, were, that I was in or influ influenced by? Influenced by, yeah. Well, I mean, I was in other bands too. I think I mentioned to you prior that I, I was in a band called, well, The Wasted. The Wasted, a, sure. That was a Bronx-based uh, punk band. Yeah. Uh, Rui against Spearhead of that with Jesse, Jesse Rivera, who's a, another great songwriter. And he's in a band, uh, his band, and I know the name, it's right there, but I'm doing an interview now. So the name's not going to come out, is it? <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> um, it'll come to me, but he's out. I think he's in a different state now. I forgot where he lives, but uh, his band's uh, Cry Havoc, it's called. Cry Havoc. Oh, Cry Havoc. Okay, okay, okay. And they're actually a really good band. And uh, Jesse, I think, is the primary writer there. I mean, he's he's uh, he's come a long way guitar-wise. Guitar and uh, I played there for a while. Then they got this drummer, Adam who later down the line played with Manny uh -huh, in a band uh -huh. called uh, Only Hell Remains. OHR, right, yeah. OHR, who I was also in, by the way, for a short period. I don't think oh, that was mentioned okay. before. Oh, no, I don't think so. Okay, okay, wow. And, yeah, that, that didn't, you know. So Adam was a really good drummer. Yeah. Even, even he's been playing a lot less than I have as far as time goes. Yeah. He was also being trained in, I think, Juilliard School of Music. I mean, so... You know, there's really no comparison to a guy who learns on his own versus Juilliard, right? So, yeah, you know, sure, sure. So I said, I can't. That's a whole different thing, you know. But a great drummer, solid. Uh, and that band eventually broke up. They did uh, Nobody Likes Us, which was the album they put out. Yeah. Really good record. Catchy, really catchy stuff. Punk stuff. Short and sweet. Great hooks, you know. Rui had a knack for writing great hooks in his music. And the band, you know, was great. Uh, I didn't record on that. That was out. I see. I see. So I was out of the band before because that's when I joined DBH. So I'm scattering it around a bit. Oh, so it was go to Mentis was, and then the wasted, wasted and, and then, then DBH. At some, at some point, then DBH. Yeah. Oh, okay. But there could have even been things between the wasted and DBH. You think, huh? Well, yeah, I think yeah. The wasted. Well, I had to choose because there was too many bands to play in at the time. Yeah, sure. As Manny, I saw the interview with Manny. Manny mentioned that, so. Um, it was too much to juggle. I said, I, I, I like punk and I enjoy playing it, but realistically I need some more hardcore stuff, more metal stuff. And that stuff is more my, my stuff. You know, that's what yeah. I play. It's more challenging too. Punk yeah. is not the most challenging music. It's more, you know, it's more sure. straightforward and it's great, but there's a limit to how far you can go in punk. Yeah. Where, you know, and the music that we played, we could sort of venture out a bit and do other things, you know, and, right. um, so yeah, DBH was down the line. Eventually, I I I joined up again with Rui and Jesse with a band called Coffin Thirteen. Changed the band name. They wanted to start a band, a horror punk band called Coffin Thirteen, which there is an album out there, and I have a lot of them put in the closet somewhere. I got to dig out. Uh, which we stood together for a little while. Didn't last long. We did record. I played bass on six of the songs. Oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, a drummer understands bass, rhythm. Sure, of course. I do have the coordination. You know, I could play a bass pretty well. If you sit with me, I'll pick it up fast. So I would sit with Jesse. He would show me the stuff, play it like this, play it like that. And I would learn enough to lay it down in the studio. And the reason I played bass is because they didn't have a bassist or a drummer. So to record, I played all the drums and I record half of the CD on bass and then they got a guy junior a friend of ours who played bass and he came in later on and finished off the recording and you know it was kind of scattered a bit so i'm on bass at least six of those songs and drums and then the rest is junior 
and uh you know pretty good album production wise it could have been better i'm i'm a stickler when it comes to production and when i hear crappy production i get mad sure but that's just me sure it's raw it's good me i want perfection you know it's not you know it's just not gonna happen you know yeah. we didn't have the money for that type of you know that's but, right uh, it was good stuff it was good stuff um and what about uh well you mentioned you were you know getting more a little more into hardcore uh around the time you were getting into dbh were you um very much into like district nine or oh. some of the rock bands <clears throat> well yeah those bands i mean we all grew up around the same time yeah so it was close call before it was district nine that's right yeah uh, oh i love those guys i mean the music that was coming out of the scene the new york scene in general but the bronx yeah. and I mean, you had District 9, you had, again, Blackout. You had all these guys. Uh, we were really close with Blackout. Uh, District 9 were great. I mean, we had Fahrenheit 451. We had uh -huh. uh, uh, Irate came a little later. That's right, yeah. And Irate, to me, were also a game changer because they sound like no one else. That's right. So if you say we're influenced by stuff, I would say Irate was one of those bands. Blackout, Right Reserved. Sure. That was with Malik, who sang in Go to Mentos for a while on the uh -huh. Several Ties CD. And he uh, he comes from that band. He played bass and vocals. Different approach, different style, but he was great. You know, he did what he did. Um, but all these bands had a distinctive sound. Yeah, they did. You could tell the difference between each one rather than, oh, they all kind of sound the same. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> you knew a District 9 album versus yeah. a an irate album or or a, again a blackout album so you would tell though there's a blackout you knew the styles they were very distinct absolutely so big i think we all influenced each other it was like a sure. circle of just ooh ooh everybody was ooing and eyeing you know irate to me again when they came on the scene it, it was a uh, game changer because of the approach that they had nando was a big fan of those you know marty friedman and all these guys Absolutely. So these really technical guys, and to incorporate that with hardcore, with some thrash elements, some heavy metal elements. So uh -huh. I wait knew how to intertwine stuff and mix things where it worked out. It worked yeah. really well, and it became unique. And Absolutely. from a drummer's perspective, Yuval UV uh, influenced me, you know. And he came a little later on, but I mean, he had a, his approach was a lot different. He wasn't a heavy hitter. UV played drums. Uh, he's more light-handed, jazz. He was more of a jazz, you know, he didn't slam the drums. He wasn't a slammer. Sure. He was more precision. You know, he would come up with these, he had a great groove to him, too. Uh, so his drumming, the way he would throw, incorporate his fills between songs, no one was doing it like he was doing it. Yeah. So, of course, I would suck a little out of him and say, I'm going to copy him a little bit, you know. <laughs> it, it was more out of it was more out of respect than it, sure. it, didn't, it wasn't intentional, though. At the end of the day, of course, it, yeah. it, that's what influence does. It's sort of you remember something and you you want to emulate it to some extent, incorporate like DBH. We did a song called Time's Up, the title song of the last demo we did. And there's parts of it where you could hear the groove is kind of irate you know. Yeah. Well, Shane they're... was Shane was influenced by it, as was I. So at the time, they were fresh. And so it was in our brain when Shane was writing. I don't think it was intentional, but it did sound, it had the irate feel to it to some extent. Sure. You know, that, that particular song, only that one song, you know? And um, there's, yeah. there, there's definitely there's definitely a lot of groove to all the Go to Mentis recording. Go to Mentis, we're a hybrid, yeah, the hardcore death metal thing. Yeah. Mostly that's what we are. We're more of a hardcore death metal band. That's right. And none of it was on purpose. It just happened that way. Yeah. And and we just wrote that way. And that's nothing was ever on purpose. It just came out the way it came out. And, you know, and I love those guys and uh, I enjoy playing with, you know, all the stuff we've done together. So I'm glad that they're back at it now, which is a good thing. Yeah, for sure. You know, and they got Tracy playing drums. And I knew Tracy for years. Tracy would always help me out, as did. Again, UV at times, I didn't have a drum set to play on. UV would say, use mine. Or even Glenn from Billy Club. Yeah. Glenn would say, yeah, you know, use some of my toms if I needed it. You know, so they would always be around to help me out when I needed it. And uh, Tracy was one. I used the drums a lot. It was whether I didn't have a drum kit. Probably what it was at the time. Yeah. I didn't have my own kit for years. <clears throat> a full kit to play shows with. 
Sure. And so those guys uh, came out to help a lot, you know? Yeah. To make sure I had something to play on until, of course, I got my own stuff later on. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much how it worked out. Do you remember, do you have very many um, distinct memories of like the house part or apartment parties or backyard parties um, that Go to Memphis played at? Well, I know we had a friend, Candy. She was from high school where I went, Walton. She yeah. was one of the people we hung out with. Her name was uh, Candy. So that was her nickname. I can't say her original name. I forgot her real name. It's a, sp <laughs> it's a Spanish name I can't pronounce. I, I think Nuri's or something. I can't remember. So yeah, she was known as Candy. So we used to, she had one in her house or two. And then we would go to, I know, I'm not sure if Anthony. It was a band called Demise for a while. Uh -huh, Big Anthony, uh -huh. we call him, who lives in Canada right now. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm not sure if you ever had uh, house parties there, but we hung out there a lot. Yeah. It's funny. I, I can't remember. It's funny. I really can't remember a lot of things that we... I could yeah. be getting senile. I mean, that's all for I know. <laughs> well, I, know so. I know one of the more, uh, in, I guess, infamous ones or famous ones, depending on your perspective, is yeah. a backyard party where uh, uh, it was Irate's first show, I think. And... Um, uh, Will from Blackout, I guess, misheard their name and told Ramon, oh, it's Iraq. So on the flyer, it says oh. Iraq. <laughs> Iraq. But Gave it was your appearance by Iraq. Yeah. Go to Memphis, Iraq. I, you know, I, it's probably Blackout played too. I forget who played, but that was. I think Blackout did play. I do, I do remember it. I remember spots of it. I know it was really good. It went down well. Yeah. 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 You know, everybody enjoyed that stuff because, again, it was outside. So you had your crowd. Right. You had. You know, you're rocking it outside. It's a, it's, it's it was a good thing, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do remember. I think I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. And again, it was like wow. Again, I rate played the first Iraq. Excuse me, Iraq <laughs> played. So uh, and they uh, again they blew our minds as far as the stuff they were coming up with. It was different. Yeah. But again, we were fans of all of our because we were all buddies and. We we always supported each other as much as we can, um, and uh, we appreciated each other because we were different. Sure, each band was distinct, and I, and we enjoy that, you know. Um. So, do you remember what was your first show with DBH? We'll get off shows in a little bit, and we'll get into recording and all. But um, just to, to hit the shows a little bit more. Um, what was your first show with DBH? If you remember, that's a good question. <laughs> Okay, because we played uh quite a few shows. We did yeah, a lot yeah. of times they were double billed again to go to Mentis and DBH, sure. but DBH did our own thing too. We did our own thing out there. Man, I can't remember the first show. Okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. Just and, and I don't. It's not because I didn't enjoy it or love it. I just I if shows become very foggy to me for some reason. It was a thing we did. I remember our rehearsals again, writing stuff. I remember our first demo we recorded at Music Unlimited. Uh, I remember those types of things. Shows, yeah. unless something crazy happened, it was a show. A show is a show, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's, it's, that's it's right. a day in the office, and you and you do your thing, and you know, yeah. I mean, I can't remember the first show we played. I do remember though playing a show because of something dumb that I did. Uh, I don't know. We were really proud of ourselves again. So I said, you know what? I want to look different for this gig. I'm going to wear a suit. <laughs> So I wore a suit, a suit like, you know, here's the drummer in the suit, right? Something different, maybe for attention. I don't know what I was thinking. Stupidity, you know? And I went in there, and the stupid thing is I wore dress shoes, too. Oh, God. <laughs> so try to play double bass drum with dress shoes, right? Forget okay. about it. So the whole night I was in agony, <laughs> and I couldn't play the songs right. And what a jackass I felt like. I mean, <laughs> talk about a jackass, right? You know, you do dumb things when you're young, right? It just I, I, it... I, I take it you, you didn't wear a suit again after that to play a show. No, no, <laughs> never again, no. First and only. And so, yeah, I thought it would be something different. You know, wear a suit, you know. Yeah. And that was really stupid. But, you know, that I, that I remember. You see, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's funny. Um, because I'm sure the perception of everybody else, how stupid I probably looked, on top of not being able to play the songs right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, well, uh, well, you you mentioned a second ago that you know uh, you you might remember other shows where uh, like out of the ordinary things happened. Are there are there other shows that you remember? Um, uh, you know, either I don't know some something went unexpectedly or um, or anything else that sticks out as far as shows go. Well, there was a show I know we played. It was Go to Mentis, I believe. We played. Uh, I'm trying to remember where it was. It was a good ride out there. I don't know if it was upstate or if it was. Uh, well, I do remember with with uh, Four in the Chamber, for instance. Again, that's another band who were great and still are great and uh, uh, were very supportive of us as we were them. And um, we played out uh, Mayo Pack and we played some other places upstate. We did a little tour together, which was. It went off great. I mean, both bands sounded great. The audiences out there were uh, different. Yeah. New York audiences are more like nothing impresses New Yorkers, you know? <laughs> you have to blow fire out of your butt and juggle, you know, play <laughs> drums. Yeah, maybe they'll clap, you know? But uh, when it came to upstate, they were asking for autographs, and they were so happy just to have a show out there. Yeah. So New Yorkers are a bit spoiled. I think that's what it is. And I love my New Yorkers. That's my place. It's always going to be, you know? I like that sort of... Uh, you know, that sort of, you know, who the hell we are type of attitude thing. That's what makes us who we are. But uh, musically, out, out out of state, you know, the fans were more, uh, you know, for the most part, they enjoyed it. These were all strangers out there. Sure. And they were so happy. They knew our names. They knew our stuff. And I'm like, you guys know about us? And, you know, so it was great. It was a great experience to venture out. So I remember that little tour we did before in the chamber. That was great. I think is um, that the tour where you all had a football game against them? I I think so. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that was it. I mean, I can't play sports in my life, really. I mean, you know. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I think four in the chamber won. Um, I, I think they did. Yeah, I do. Remember, yeah, I remember something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a football guy. I could play a yeah. little baseball, little foot basketball, you know. But yeah, I believe they did win. You have Frank on the team, who I drove yeah. crazy. Yeah, you know. I draw Frankie crazy, the guitarist. I draw him nuts the whole time <laughs> because I'm naturally hyperactive. I think it slowed down a bit. Unfortunately, n not all the way yet. <laughs> so, uh, whatever, you know. So I drove him crazy in the whole, you know, the whole drive there. Like, put some Maiden on. He's like, no, we're not putting Maiden on, Frank. You know, five minutes later, hey, Frankie, what's up? Put some Maiden on. I want to hear some Maiden. <laughs> I would get him. I'm going to throw you out of the window, Frank. I swear. <laughs> But he didn't really mean it, or maybe he did. He, he is Italian. We have tempers, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but no, we had a great time overall. We went out there and we played, and so, uh, the, yeah, the football game. It's kind of vague, but I, I, I do, I do, I do remember something like that happening. Sure, sure. Um, so let's talk. Uh, let's let's work our way through. You know your your memories of the different um, recordings you've been on with all of these different bands over the years. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the go to Memphis demo, the first demo, that's the first, is that the first recording you were on? Well, the first demo. Yeah. Yeah. It just says go to Memphis on it. Yep. Yeah. That's it has the goat yeah. yep. character on it. Yeah. Which they just released on death farm. Yep. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think they would. I mean, they, they put out that double CD of all of our stuff. I thought that was, and we appreciate that they even did that. That was great. It was so awesome, you know. But then now they're releasing the individual stuff. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, we never thought that would happen. So that's really cool that the, the band is gaining traction 30 years later, you know. That's right. We're rolling, rolling wheelchairs. Yeah. <laughs> <you know>? So. <laughs> oh, I guess. Was there, was there a compilation that you all were on before the demo? starving artist or something like that do you remember Striving that for togetherness i think oh have... maybe that was it yeah 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 i believe so yeah i know there was a record we were on too a little vinyl and lp you know, those little records they used to make there yeah, yeah 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 and uh i know we were on something like that uh we were on yeah i believe that's funny there was a little magazine going around i'm trying to remember which one it was it was pretty popular, but you could get it at Bleaker Bob's, one of those independent magazines. Yeah, sure. And it came with a little vinyl record, and then the vinyl record it. had a mix of different bands. We were on that. Yeah. 
and I believe the record was red. It was a red vinyl, one of those smaller vinyls. Yeah, sure. And um, I do remember that little things like that, little highlights like that, that made us really happy. Um, as far as recording, that could go through every everything we recorded. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Let's. As far yeah, as compilations, I think that was certainly one of them. Um, I know DBH were on a couple as well. Yeah, that's right. I think uh Newfound Hope it was called. Newfound yeah, Hope. New, yeah, that's Newfound right. Newfound Hope, two volumes. I think we were on both of those volumes. Yeah. Which we recorded two songs, you know, specifically for. Or our two latest songs DBH had, Take This Pain and One to Blame. Those are the name of both of the songs. That was on the compilation there. And I think when the second volume came out, we did our Time's Up demo. I think we used some stuff from that, uh -huh. a song or two from that. And used it for there. And uh, again, Go to Memphis has been on a couple of things. I can't remember everything. I remember our recordings. Sure, as far sure. As compilations ago, I do remember a vinyl and one of those independent magazines. I think yeah. it's the one I'm thinking of, maybe with like no redeeming social value. And I don't know. They, I believe they were on that too. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the one I'm thinking of. But I think, I think you're right. I think yeah. I have it, which is funny enough, buried away somewhere. Wow. Yeah. I think it's 95. So I guess Yeah, I think you're right. You're good. First. You know um, your stuff. Uh but but yeah, let's talk about the, you know, just the 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 only go to Mentis recordings, you know, not the compilations. Okay. Um because we yeah, want to hear about that, where they were recorded that you remember, and like your experience of recording, because um yeah. Okay, well the first demo we recorded that in the place where we rehearsed with DBH. Um that 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 basement from the house that a friend of Tito's yeah <clears throat> I believe it was a friend of Tito's okay it could have been Manny's friend too I'm not sure okay and by the way I want to thank Manny and everybody for mentioning my name throughout these interviews I I didn't You've I never seen a myself popular mention <laughs> I don't yeah I just I figured I was just a guy doing it the fact that people have memory of it makes you know makes me feel good you know you know yeah. and that was and I and I always respected those guys. As people, Manny's a great musician, a great friend, and all these guys, you know, uh, you know. So, but yeah, the first demo was recorded in that same area there. Uh, how the music was laid down. I don't know if somebody had a four track, one of those four track machines. Sure, sure, sure. And um, laid the music down. Martin, he sang the vocals in a, in the bathroom. <sighs> there was a little bathroom there. I think he stood in the shower with the with the curtain <laughs> closed and. Let me trap in the voice, you know. I'm gonna trap it in, you know. <laughs> and he's in a bathtub. I don't know where he's saying it, but it was in a stall somewhere in a bathroom over there. And you know, it came out pretty good considering, you know. Yeah, yeah, but, sure. Um, I do remember that recording was there. And as far as severed ties goes, that was recorded, I believe, in Leon. He was in Rights Reserved, he was a guitar player. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Um and Alex was the drummer. I was close with Alex, too, and those guys, Malik. And he had a little one of the track machines there. And we went to his place where they, I think they also rehearsed, right, reserved, practiced. And I used Alex's drum set to record it. And, uh, yeah, Milton, all the guys were there. We recorded our stuff there. Uh, musically, that's why we did the music part. Vocally... Malik was doing vocals at the time. I think he recorded all his vocals at Ramon's house in his room. Oh, so we had the track machine, so we would layer it on. You know, there was a way to layer it, and Ramon was pretty good with that stuff. He's good with technical stuff. Yeah. And uh, he figured out a way to put on his vocals. Or was the Leon ever come over that? I think Leon might have shown up to Ramon's house to set it up, and they did it together, setting it up for Malik to do his vocal work on it and stuff. So I think that's how Severed Ties was put together. Two different places put together. And what about and, Suicide? But Suicide... Oh, yeah, we did have a demo, right? Yeah, I forgot this. Yeah, five, I think NY, five tracks on it. Yeah, I think it's the New York says NYDC across it. Yeah, that's suicide. right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Th that one, I honestly don't remember where we recorded that. Okay, 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 I see. I see. That one, that one in particular, I, I, I don't I don't know if it was at a rehearsal space or I, I really 
don't remember why we did that. Martin was still on that one, and I think. Yeah, he was. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if I misremember. Maybe Nando was on that one. Is that right? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, he wrote uh, "Father Hour." I think he wrote that song. Yeah, yeah. I believe that's the song that Nando wrote uh, yeah. for the band. Uh, I believe that's the track. Um. Yeah, he was on that demo too. Yeah. Yeah. I see. I see. Wow. That's when he joined because we used to go in and out with different players as far as other guitarists. Sure. You know, Ramon came in through me <clears throat> because uh, Rendon left. And we had Milton. I think we had Milton still at the time. Yeah. And um, I met Ramon at one of these parties. I guess that was one of those house parties. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we hung out. And I know he said he played guitar and stuff. And I says, well, you know, we're looking for a guy. I want you to come to a rehearsal. You know, and I think that's kind of how it worked out. And Ramon has, uh, you know, the later material, especially he's written primarily, he's written all of it, most of it. And he's a good songwriter. He's a great rhythm player, too. So he writes really solid stuff, some cool time changes there. So he's a good writer, you know, yeah. and uh, always had fun writing with him. And uh, so, yeah, that's how Ramon got into the band. Milton, I think he left for a while and we got other guitarists. Nando was one of them. Nando came in for a while, wrote a song with us, played a show or two, I'm not mistaken, and record recorded the demo. Yeah. You could tell because we plays Lee, you just say, Yeah, that's Nando. You know. Yeah, that's right. Very just that's a whole different thing going on right there, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I mean that 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 demo where it was recorded, I can't remember exactly. Yeah. No, that's fine. So, uh -huh. And and then there was, I guess, a, a a little bit of a hiatus between severed ties and the the full length go to Memphis. Um, but there was uh, a yeah, there was there was a I want to say a couple of years we didn't do anything. Yeah, and then we got back together, and uh, that's when we rented that room at Music Unlimited. Uh huh. And at the time, we found Greg, who you did interview. That's right. And uh, you know he was on the uh full length you know he was on all of it he did all the leads and stuff and uh yeah greg was great he's a great guitar player too a different approach altogether very yeah you know he's european of course it's going to be different you know <laughs> yeah that's right he brought uh, that polish flavor to it you know which which, <laughs> which no one else could do except except greg you know that's right you know so greg was great and uh yeah great guitar player good guy yeah where where did you all record um the full length? Well, that was recorded upstate. Oh, was that at a JC's place? Yeah, well, yeah, that was uh yeah. Uh, where John I Christoph. record chords and uh, yes. you know, a bunch of yes. a bunch of bands, I think. But uh, and uh, we, and go yeah, we went up there for that. DBH went up there several times, and recorded with JC as well. Yeah, you know, we had a nice setup there, and he's a good he's a good uh he has a good ear for it. He's really yeah. good at what he does. You know, I wonder if he still does it. Probably. Too. Probably, I think Blackout recorded up there. Yeah, know. Blackout. He was the guy to go to. Yeah, I yeah. rate. I believe did too. Yep, yep. He was the guy. He was the buzz that was going around. JC, go up there, to JC. You know, and he'll make it work. And he did. He always made it work. You know. Yeah, yeah. He didn't rip anybody off. He wasn't that type of guy. Sure. He cared more about the product than anything. And uh, he was a nice guy too. So you know. What um what set did you record with on the full length? If you remember. I don't know. I think I had my drum kit at the time. Okay. Or because JC had his own drum set. Yeah. A pretty much a complete drum set. Yeah. I would just bring maybe the hardware, the cymbals, the pedals, the, the snare, or whatever it was, right? If if I'm mistaken, I mean I could be mistaken. I could have brought my own kit or the hardware for the kit that he had there. Yeah, sure, sure. Cool um, yeah, I believe that. I can't really, because we recorded, we did two sessions there. Okay. You know, we ran through a lot of the older stuff first. This is when we just got back together, too. Yeah. I wouldn't say we were in the best shape as far as our, you know, how tight we were, but we pulled it off, recorded several tracks there, and then came back to record newer songs that we've written. Because we wanted some new material with some old ones that people knew or, you know, ones we haven't uh, laid down yet. 
Sure. But newer tracks and the newer tracks, you could tell the difference between the quality sound, the sound quality and the the progression. Yeah. You know, as far as the style and stuff. So uh there were two sessions, I believe, there. Two or three, I think it was two, as far as laying all the music down. Yeah. I think Barry went in at some point and and, and laid down all the vocals. And uh yeah, that's pretty much where we did it. And do you want to talk? Uh, you don't have to if you don't want to, but do you want to talk, you know, more about Milton and, you know, yeah. your memories of Milton and, um, you know, I guess how his death affected the band and all of that? Well, Milton, yeah. I mean, we, again, we grew up together uh, at that period. When Milton joined the band, I wouldn't say it was that long after Go to Mentis was together. But again, Barry's better with timelines. I, I know we did eventually. We heard about Milton. Maybe Rendon knew Milton first or something to that effect. <clears throat> In any case, we met Milton, of course, and he's a great, he was a great guy. Good spirit, good person, great taste in music, too. Because Milton was a huge fan of the European death metal stuff. Uh-huh. The more melodic stuff. And he was a big That's fan right. of it. Too. And, and he played it really well, too. So, um, you know, his style, his, uh, you know, again, especially as a person, he was a good guy. So he was a close friend of ours, too. He was a brother to us. And, uh, yeah, he 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 died on the same day. Well, I wouldn't say he died. I say he was killed. There's a big difference between yeah, he died right. or was killed, you know. That's right. Um, and that's a whole different thing. I could get angry about that, uh, you know. That's a whole different thing. So yeah, it it messed us up a lot because that was the same day we all were supposed to meet up. I think at Manny's house because at this time Manny was in Go to Mentis. Manny joined in to play bass uh, from DBH, you know, and uh, and Manny was a big contributor too. I mean, great bass player, uh, you know, and just you know always great to play in a band with Manny because he understood me more than anybody as far as my drumming. Me yeah. and Manny knew how to gel, you know? Uh, we had a natural ability to just know what Frank's going to do next. Manny knew what I was going to do next instinctively. Wow. Not every bassist knows that, you know? That's right. That's <laughs> so, so, yeah, Manny was great like that. Um, But, yeah, so we went there, and everybody, uh, Manny had a long face on. You know, supposed to be happy. Hey, what's up, guys? Yeah. That was the day Milton was supposed to go over there, too. We're supposed to have a reunion, a meeting, right? So we all showed up there, and... uh yeah, Manny's face was like like stone stone, you know. So I was like, something's not right. What happened? You know, he didn't want to speak at first, and he's like, "Come in, Frank, so to talk to me." What happened? And I don't know if Barry was at that house yet. He might have been there already. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was Barry who told me the news or if it was Manny who told me the news. So yeah, that was where the news happened. He was found, and and, and what happened, and we didn't know. We thought it was a car accident or. You know, we didn't know the detail. We thought he crashed or something. Yeah, sure. Which, which happens most frequent. People have accidents. Things happen, you know. Uh, when we got more detail as to what happened, uh, that's when, yeah, that's when it really got, you know, because it, it was horrible as it is originally, but then finding out how it happened made it a lot worse. So, I know. But yeah, it changed. It changed us for a long time. We, I don't, The band continued at some point. We stopped for a while. Yeah. And that's where we got Greg. See, again, I'm skipping different – That's I can't help that. That's fine. That's but, fine. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, Milton was uh, – that affected us still to this day, you know, still to this day. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, – I can't tell you. I can't really get into detail. Yeah, sure. But yeah. It, it, it was horrible. It was a horrible yeah. thing, and it still is a horrible thing. And that guy should be dead, but he's not. Now I understand he's trying to get out. Yeah. Uh, he's not going to get out. It was a federal crime. The judge that did sentence him gave him life without yeah. possibility of parole. So they always try, but he's not going to come out. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And if he did, maybe it's a good idea he does, because then somebody could take care of business. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Either way, he shouldn't be able to breathe. But in any case, so yeah, that affected us a lot. You know, he had a, a young daughter at the time, and his little girl loved her dad. So when you put that all together, he was feeling good. You know, he's going to get engaged at the time too to another a girl who, who we're all close with, uh, and uh, it didn't work out. Everything just went. He took his life, and uh, he was a great guy. 
a great person, great friend. I used to bother him all the time because I would cut school, being that his house is where we did rehearsals, right? Whenever I cut school, I'd go to Milton's house, right? <laughs> you know, seven in the morning, eight in the morning, boom, 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 boom on his door, you know? His <laughs> hair's all messy. Hey, Frankie, what's up, man? Hey, you want to rehearse, you know? <laughs> so I would hang in that house a lot. With, with them, whether it was with Milton or, or, or his brother Brian, yeah. who I'm very tight with. Brian is, is his younger brother. So you got Brian, Alan, and Milton, those three, right? So, yeah, I was really close with those three. We hung out a lot at the time and uh, still am very close with them. I don't speak to many people that much anymore. It's not because I don't want to. It's just because just I, I, I just work. I'm one of those people I lock into a certain thing, and I just it's like a record for me. It's like a... Yeah. Autopilot. I'm in autopilot sometimes. And uh, especially living out here now, you know, sure. my wife and, and son. So uh, I got to make sure that they're always happy and they have a home and they have food. And so my goal is them, you know. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I don't mean anything by it. I go through a lot of things. I've been through a lot. I've lost a lot. But I don't do anything to escape it. Like a lot of people I know, they try to drink or they do this and that's their way to do it. I always face things on head on every day, but it does knock you around a bit sometimes. You know, you're not, you know, you're, you're not bulletproof. So I go into these sort of maybe walking depressions. You know, I'm not saying I'm depressed where I'm going to jump off a building, but I go through these things where I just kind of numb up and I just kind of just go. Yeah. Um, I don't forget anything. I think about it all the time again, because I'm not escaping. Yeah. So I'm I'm in my head all the time. So but I did. I know how to juggle it and work with it, so I just don't really. I feel have time, or I, I just need to find the effort to really start speaking more to all those people because I haven't. You know, everybody goes their own way sometimes. You know, you know, everybody does their own thing. I keep in touch with Barry, of course, all the time, and Barry is probably the only one really, uh, as far as you know all the guys go but every every time we do touch base it's like it was yesterday so sure you know everybody understands you know it's nothing personal i just don't yeah sometimes i lose touch for a while yeah you know and it's not in any bad way it's just just the way it happens you know but yeah milton's death was a big deal so and it still is a big deal still is yeah yeah um and i know there were multiple or multiple memorial shows for you know oh yeah multiple years after he was murdered and all um we were doing as long as the band was together we always had a, a milk a memorial show yeah for milton so yeah as long as we were around after that we had shows put together for that yeah and those are great we raised money for the family i remember and any expense for the for his kid actually i think it was for his daughter yeah so we you know whatever money we could get we gave it to her or whatever it was we tried our best you know yeah to some sort of show our condolences in some sort of way, you know, it was hard to continue. You know, even to record all that stuff was really difficult with, with without him. So that full length came through a lot of emotional, uh, you know. You know, there was a time when I was recording, <clears throat> I couldn't get it together. I mean, I had to go outside, have a smoke. I said, I, I am not. Barry came out there and said, you all right? He's like, yes, I'm not, I'm not in the zone right now, you know. Yeah. So after a little pep talk and we had to talk a little bit, I just paced myself and then I managed to lay down the tracks the best way I could at the time. So sure. So we were coming off of that almost directly into the studio, no real rehearsals in between. So we were like, we're just going in raw and just try to. So yeah, that's wow. how it went down there. Wow. Um, so why don't you talk some more about other recordings you've been on? You mentioned, you've mentioned a few like with DBH and, and all, but let's hear some more specifics about the different recordings outside of Go to Mentis that you've been on that you remember. Uh, the DBH stuff? Yeah, yeah. Is it uh, any anything other than DBH? Well, yeah. Well, DBH, I could say DBH has some history. That's right. Again, we recorded two songs at... Music Unlimited. They had a little recording thing at the time, Chango Productions or something like that. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. <clears throat> and I think Tito was mentioning the all the echoes they put on the vocals and they do all these crazy things. But I have to say, the material we had two songs there. It was Untrue and Social Decline. Those are the two yeah. songs. I think Social Decline is still my favorite song the band's ever written, and that was our first two songs we written together as a as a new 
unit with me in the band, right? Um, I would say that's my favorite DBH song. I would say Way It All Out. And there's there are many great ones to me. I just love that song. Just the, the, the chorus, the, the way it drives. It's just a really good song. I just wish we redone it, you know? Sure, Whatever we sure. Done them. Um, you know, down the line, we recorded, again, the, de- the, the Time's Up demo. And I don't think we recorded anything in between that. Oh, yeah. Well, the compilation stuff. Compilation stuff, yeah. The, the We Found Hope stuff. We we laid tracks down for that, and those are really good things. And uh, uh, after that, again, uh, Coffin 13, I recorded the full length oh, album with them. Uh huh. I played bass again on the about six songs. And uh, I did record one song in 2007, well, 2009, 2007. I know it was uh, only how OHR. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they almost got me in the band immediately without a real rehearsal. Frank, you're in. That's it. I was like, okay, I'm following Adam, Mr. Juilliard over there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so I was like, I, I don't know. I heard their material. And excuse me one second. Oh, sure, sure. That's fine. Yeah. And I heard their material. And I was like, Adam's a really uh, solid technical player. And some of the things he did, I was like, I don't know if I could really pull that off. Yeah. Realistically. Manny, sure. of course, Manny has faith in my playing. We played so many years together. <clears throat> and uh, so we had rehearsals. They went okay. They went good. But they weren't where I thought they needed to be. I eventually left the band because I didn't feel I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Yeah. There were some things out of my league. I felt the drumming there was out of my league. However, <clears throat> we did record one song called, uh, I'm trying to remember now, The Cleansing, it's called. Okay. And we did that. And it's a solid song, too. We recorded it. And it's the one track we recorded together, and it was really good. So that was the last time I recorded anything. I see. And, uh, yeah, that didn't last, but at least there's a song out there. Yeah. I see. So Go to Mentis, DBH, Coffin 13, OHR, any other bands you recorded with over the years that you remember? Um... Not recorded with, no. Okay. Okay, I see. I've been in other bands between there, too. I played some shows with. I was in a band called The Missing. The Missing. uh, Fronted by uh, Donna Marie, who's a female vocalist. Uh, She's a really good vocalist. You told me that. I'm sure you heard of her. She was a big in the club scene type stuff. The only issue that, you know, when I joined that band, it was something different. There were times where I guess I would hear my dad in my, my head saying, you know, I need to try to, like Manny has done the same thing. We venture out. And we yeah. try to play stuff that's a, outside of the box. You know, don't put yourself in a box. Try something else. It's not like we didn't like other styles of music. So it's like, let's try to actually play different styles of music. And uh, they were more, you know, typo negative type sound. And 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 she was a big Susie and the Banshees fan and stuff like that. And great musicians I joined in. I was a way more technical drummer than their their previous drummer. And we were together about six months. The only problem I had with that was no matter what we wrote, the, she, the vocalist just, she couldn't sing to it. It's like, I'm not feeling that. Mm. <clears throat> so when you go through six months of not feeling something, it's like six months, we should have about two albums written at that point. Yeah, you know? That's right. So, you know, it was one of those things where I couldn't stay there anymore. It's like the creativity thing is not happening. Yeah. It was supposed to be a band effort, but it was more about a backing band to the vocalist, right? I see, I see. So that didn't work out. And it was good band, talented band, but, uh, you know, it was more about backing the vocalist rather than a band effort. Sure. And so I quit that band. We didn't record anything. We had a live show recorded, I believe, at the Lemoore's. Oh, I see. <clears throat> uh, they, they, She has that material, I guess. I don't know if it was ever released, but yeah. And that was that, but that band... Then I really went out of the I went out of the zone when there was this band called Jonas Bronk. Huh. So it it, it it plays off of the name that the founder of the Bronx. Uh-huh. <laughs> I guess they're a Bronx band if they would name their band after the founder of the Bronx. Yeah, you think so, right? What kind of Not music? a metal band at all. I mean, more of a yeah. folky rock and roll, maybe Springsteenish. Huh. Uh so I was like, you know, I'm really gonna go out of it this time. I'm gonna try something really different, you know? 
<laughs> and that only lasted maybe a month or two. You know, that didn't work out. Wow. I couldn't get I couldn't get into it. Yeah. I was my my had a goal. I says if I make it here and I make a lot of money, then I could use that money to go back to the stuff I love playing to begin with. Yeah, definitely. You definitely. know, and bring up bring up the bands that I love and bring us up and, and you know, I had a a goal not to play that style of music for the rest of my life. No, that yeah. wasn't the goal. So um well, well yeah. speak, speaking of, you know, bringing up other other bands in in the scene uh um do you have very many memories of um, the BDC, you know, the Boogie Down crew? Um, and, uh, you know, I know some bands were kind of more in that orbit than than others. Tito talked a lot about it, of course, but just wondering what you remember about it. Well, yeah, Tito. Well, BDC was started off as, as a uh, Boogie Down crew. So it was... My issue I had with it, I didn't have an issue with it until people started to use it as a gang thing. And when people started to take it to a whole different, so when I get, it was just about bands from the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. Boogie Down crew, the bands that come from the Bronx. <clears throat> but then you have guys, let me put on a bandana and say, I'm with the BDC. <laughs> so, you know, and then when it got uh, out of hand and stuff like that started happening, you know, I covered mine up. I got a tattoo that covers it up. I, I, Sure. I don't affiliate with gangs. I'm an individualist. I don't like gangs. I don't need to be a sure. part of a gang to feel like, you know, that's not me. So sure. some guys kept theirs. Some didn't. Uh, that's how I took it. But it was great in terms of meeting other people. You know, all the bands that we met we used to be under this umbrella now, the BDC Boogie Down crew. And we could shine as this, you know, unit from the Bronx of all these different bands and different talent. And so that was great. You met a lot of people through that. Yeah. And uh, we uni unif unified a lot. We did shows under that banner, BDC shows and sure. You know, the bands that come from the Bronx. So, you know, it was uh it was great. You know, it was great in terms of that when it got stupid because you know, you always got to have a couple of knuckleheads that they want to be a part of something and they 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 think it's okay to turn it into something it's not. Yeah, sure, sure. And so it started getting at a level like that, it says, I'm not going to be affiliated with anything that has to do with violence or, or gangs, because that's not what we're about here. So I had mine covered up and I was like, yeah. So that's just how it goes, you know? Sure. Sure. Actually, you know, the police are looking for you. There's one with a BDC tab. Boom, 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 boom. Right? <laughs> I didn't do anything. I play drums, man, you know? <laughs> this is some moron who's probably not even in a band that yeah. hangs with the crew, you know? Yeah, that's right. So you, you don't take chances like that. So especially you live in the Bronx, there are gangs out there. Yeah, that's right. You have the Crips, well, not the Crips. You have the blood. You have this running around, and then BDC. What's that mean, man? You know, <laughs> and God forbid somebody did something stupid with a BDC yeah, tat. That's right. I might get shot, right? So I was yeah. like, you know, I can't get shot. <laughs> I got a demo to record. I can't get shot. You know, so yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but you know, yeah. So uh, uh, there's a final question that I'll ask in a little bit, but before we get there, are there other things about your, um, you know, musical journey that you want to share right now? You know, whether things we haven't touched on yet or, you know, I, I know you said, um, uh, you know, the last recording you played on was the the, the OHR recording. If, if there's things you went on to do after that, you can also share that too. Well, I tell you, I, I, since then I haven't recorded, I haven't played. I mean, Go to Mentis did try to get back together before COVID hit. Uh, the timing, the thing is, even if COVID didn't hit, the truth of the matter is it was me for the most part. I think that flaked out sometimes because of the timing. Um, you know, Barry had his times where he couldn't rehearse. He had his own things. He was he had a lot of you know his children. He has things he has right. to deal with. You know. But he's a vocalist. He could practice in the car while he's driving to work. Yeah. The, the, the musician aspect of it, you have to be in the studio. There is no, let me do it on the steering wheel, you know. That's right. Not, not the same, you know. But uh, we try getting back together. I could only rehearse maybe one day a week, and it's only for like two or three hours. I work two jobs. So I said, that is not going to happen. It's not going to work. It's not enough rehearsal. It's not enough time. I said, if we're going to do this, we have to do this right and come back really tight with new material. You know, I really had a, we had a goal. Yeah. 
and then of course it, it wasn't really we could have reached that goal not with the time that I had available sure and then when COVID hit it got really bad because they closed everything down and you know now I got forced to get two vaccinations that's in my body right now God knows what it's doing I don't believe in it I was forced it's that or I couldn't work yeah so again everybody has political differences some believe in that stuff some don't I think it's a crock of shit um, I think that was just a test to see how many people could jump on one foot, pat their head, rub their belly, and uh, hmm. you know, huh, there's a good percentage there. Let's try the next one, see what happens then, right? Anyway, they're not over with us yet, yeah. So that's a whole different thing. But the point is, during that period, you're trying to fight for your job, sure. I worked in the security field, so I was, I was needed so I could work. Um, so like just like doctors, they they could work. So yeah, I went through that whole thing. There was no time really to to play music. Yeah, yeah. And it's been a few years of that. And then eventually, you know, right now again, the band has been getting some traction out there as far as Death Farm Records and a lot of these guys on YouTube, these uh these uh interviewers out there who have been helping a lot getting the the band's name out there. And sure. Barry too. Barry got his goat metal show thing that oh, he's been absolutely. doing for. And, you know, he's he's been working really hard on that <clears throat> for a few years now. So it's all getting out there. The name's getting out there. This record label picked it up where they could print out our material. And I understand it's doing pretty well out there in Japan and other places. And so I'm just happy that they're all together right now and they're uh, going forward. And I told them, whatever you guys do, make sure you're tight as hell and you blow anybody else off the stage. Okay. Yeah. That's all yeah. you need to do, you know. So I'm not there. Unfortunately, I can't be. I wish I could, but I can't. I have my son. Again, he's going to be three in May. And I couldn't imagine life without him. So his, he's my focus, you know. He's my boy, so. Sure. You know, he took my heart and he has with him everywhere he goes, you know. <laughs> so, and of course, my wife too, you know. But, you know, your little boy is your little boy, right? That's right, yeah. So he's still a baby. He's going to be three, but he's still a baby to me. He's still a baby. So... There's a lot of work to do with him to make sure his life turns out okay. So musically, I mean, in Minnesota, there's a scene out here, I'm sure. There's people here and there that you see. I had a guy deliver food to me that had a, a Slayer shirt on recently. I was like, okay, that, that's a sign, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's a sign. I'm sure if I wanted to start a band up, I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a matter of getting comfortable and having the time to do it. That's right. Because when I do something, I want to do it right. You don't want to half-ass it. You want to do it right. You want to do it the right way. Sure. Especially if it's a thing that I haven't done for years. Oh, Frankie's back in the scene. He's doing music. It just sucks. You know, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, you want it to be true. a lot better than it was before, right? Sure. So, you know, who knows? Down the line, I do. I miss it. You know, drumming, again, since I was a little boy, before I even had, I was banging on pots and pans, right? Ever since I seen Ringo, that was it. So drumming is inside of me. Music is inside of me. It's always going to be. And the fact that I don't have it, and I haven't done it for so many years, it's like I'm missing a part of me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a part of me that I, it was my therapy. It was my, it still is to listen to, but as, as far as physically playing it, you know, if you're having a bad day, you go behind the drum set. Yeah. If you're having a great day, you go behind the drum set. But it was a way to get out your, very therapeutic, very healthy, you know. Yeah. So not doing that for years, you know. I'm surprised I haven't killed anyone yet. So that's <laughs> <laughs> you know. But yeah, I miss it, and I can't say it's never going to happen. I think something down the line, I could start something out here, you know. And you'll be one of the first people to know about it. <laughs> you'll be the first. I'll let you know, you know, just so you know. Awesome. It's not from the Bronx. Yeah, I don't think they have a you Minnesota are. <laughs> Museum of uh, History over here. Maybe they do, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so speaking of from the Bronx, um, uh, I'm curious to, you know, this is a question I always ask towards the end. Um, if you think that there's like a Bronx heavy sound or Bronx, you know, hardcore or metal sound, however you want to define it, um, or it might that's not good. be a sound, maybe that it's stands out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing about, you know, Think about the Bronx, it does stand out because the Bronx, like my brother Andrew always says, the Bronx is a different country in New York City. You know, yeah. it's like its own, it's its own place. Then you have 
Staten Island, who nobody cares about. It's like the the, the stepchild, right? That's right. They have Manhattan, Queens, and and, 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 uh, and Brooklyn, which are all fantastic. They have a lot of great stuff coming out of those boroughs. Yes, they do. Yeah, they always did, you know. But uh, the Bronx is different, and like you always said, and the reason that's why you're probably doing this whole thing is to put some spotlight on the Bronx because you think rap right away. You think because hip hop started there and, and and all this type of stuff. A lot of uh, the freestyle artists came from the Bronx, big time. That's right. So, uh, and I love those people, and I love that whole thing because the Bronx is a, is 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 a mixing pot of everything. I think more so than any other borough. Yeah, for sure. We are, you know, we're a different uh, different animal. I think, and the music shows that lyrically, the aggression, the style, the journey is in the music. Yeah, and the journey is a bit different, I think, than other places. So yeah, it does stand out. I think original sounding music and, and and just in general, even rappers, rappers that came from the Bronx, I mean, they're great, you know. I know. Versus somewhere in Compton, you know. Yeah, that's right. You know, more simplistic. They don't have, they have experience. Don't get me wrong. They have the gangster thing and the whole thing, but the Bronx just had something else. Yeah. And I think that's why hardcore is a big thing in New York City because, you know, hardcore is, if you if you want to weigh it out, it's, it's, it's the hip hop of, of heavy music. Yeah. For sure. It is. It has groove. It has breakdowns. It makes you bop your head. It's it's more, it's the hip hop of metal, you know? Yeah. And that's what hardcore is. And that's why I think we, when bands I was in, a lot of it had the hardcore influence because we're from that. That's the Bronx. And that's, that's that element is always going to be in us. And any breakdown you hear in hip hop, that's a straight up bop your head stuff. What do yep. you do to hip hop? You bop your head to it. The that's lyrics right. are very similar in terms of the journey and struggle and Whatever it is, the drugs and the whatever it is, it's very similar in, in format, you know. It's just delivered a different way. Yeah, sure. So I think that's that's to me, that's the closest gonna get to hip hop in the metal scene is the hardcore scene. You know, and uh Biohazard knew that. That's why they incorporate a lot of the rap elements to it. That's right. They knew that and they understood that. And that's why they weren't afraid to try it out. Yeah. They were the first, in my opinion, hybrid man before all these other bands, Limp Biscuits and all these guys, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Even even uh, Lincoln Park, you have the screamer and the rapper, right? Uh huh. I said Biohazard has Billy and Evan. They've been doing it way before you guys. Yep, yep. <laughs> you know, yep. Uh, Billy and Evan have been doing it since since what the eighties? I think. Yeah. I think the first demo came out in 89, 88. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. The first Biohazard, they're an eighties band, you know. Yeah. And they're, and they're out there again, finally doing it, and they sound great. <clears throat> but yeah, the Bronx has its own sound, as did Brooklyn. New York City has its own sound, but the Bronx in particular has its it's a it's a whole different world, basically. Yeah. yeah. And and like you said with Go to Memphis specifically, it's an or organic thing that happened. It's not like any band said, Oh, we're gonna mix this. You know, they they didn't sit down beforehand and say, We're gonna mix this and this and this. It's just everything naturally came together and you know, the different sounds. And again, different, I guess, cultures too. You know, yep. most, most, all my best friends, if most of them, I would say 99% are Hispanic or black, right? Yeah, sure. So it, it, it's, you know, when I, again, moving to Minnesota was like, wow, there's white people? I didn't see them in a while. <laughs> I'm the only one. I've been the only one for the last, God knows how, you know, so, but, you know, it, to me, I, I do miss I miss New York City for those things. I love the culture. I love the mix. My wife is Dominican. I mean, she's from yeah. DR. Sure. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, I, I do miss a lot of things. The thing is, you can't survive out there. It's too expensive. Yeah, I know. I know. I and know. Minnesota's, been, Minnesota's been nice. It's a nice place. People are more passive aggressive here, which <laughs> irks, it irks me more because I'm a New Yorker. I wear it right here on the sleeve. Yeah, sure. Whereas they pretend, and I don't like that. That bothers yeah. me. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to start breaking that down soon. I'm going to change this whole place, you know, <laughs> because I tell you one thing that's not going to happen. I'm not going to conform. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a conformist. I, I, I mean, no matter where I go, I come from the hood, but do I sound like I come from the hood? No, I didn't become my environment. I'm too much of an individual to try to fit in and become what's around me. I'm me in the mix of everything else. Right. Sure. So, you know, that's how it's always been with me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, again, the Bronx has been great. Our music came out that way because of different musical influence, but then a lot of things in common, too. 
Wow. Yeah, well, nothing wow. came nothing came accidental. I mean, nothing came on purpose. It all came natural on music right. sound. Yeah. That's right. We're proud of we're, we're proud of everything we've done. So uh well, is there anything else you'd like to say in closing? Well, first and foremost, thank you for doing this for us. So my pleasure. Now, the fact that you're out here putting us on the map, basically, more on the forefront in this Bronx Historical, what is it called? The Bronx Historical Museum? Is that what it's that is that the name of the so the we we have a we have a museum of Bronx history, but the overall organization is the Bronx Historical Society. Society, yes, and I, I researched it too, and I think it's wonderful. And the fact that you're giving the Bronx a voice, the heavy music from that borough is great because, like yeah, you said, most people don't put the two together. You yeah. know, it's the Bronx and heavy music, death metal, heavy metal, <laughs> hardcore from the Bronx. Yeah, right. You know. Yep. You know, but uh, I'm glad, I'm really glad you're doing that. And I think it's great that you're doing it. So I, do, oh. I really appreciate that. And I do appreciate all my friends, you know, from all these, you know, all the interviews you've done, all the friends over the years and bands that I played with and all these, are all my friends out there, you know, saying these nice things about me, the ones who spoke about me. I just, it's, you know, it baffles me because I'm like, really, you know, <laughs> I just, I just, I just play drums, you know. I think like I think like Manny says, because I was so young when I did it, I think that grabs a lot of attention, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Because you know, like you said with Barry, who's this little guy who can, you know, play play drums? Because you yeah. know, even though you were just a couple years at, at that age, you know, it's like it's like a decade it seems like a decade apart, you know? Um, it does. It's a, true, this yeah. little whiz kid playing drums. Um <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. No, again, it's it's never left me. It's still in me. It's just a matter of when. And if I'm not crippled, again, if I'm not senile, you know, I'm forgetting everything. So who knows? You know, I might be Bruce Willis in another year. You know, <laughs> I love Die Hard. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> I'm not making fun. You know, I'm just saying. You know? so, I love your movies. What's a movie? You know, that's all that. Then you'll know something is bad. You know, but if if I'm healthy and and, and willing to go, then yeah, maybe down the line sometime. All right. Well, we'll 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 look forward to uh, you know a uh, a Frankie Lasco production out of Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, and of course I have Bronx labeled all over it. New York Bronx. <laughs> Wear my Yankee hat, you know, and all my Bronx yeah. gear, you know. Yeah, that's right. I mean, of course, I'm not conforming. I don't conform. <laughs> I like this place. I, I could pay my bills here. You know, it's good for my son to grow up. You know, for sure, for sure, and stuff like that. It's a better way of life, and I do love it for that. But New York is my home. It's always going to be my home. So, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Frank. I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay.